Chapter One of Lord Clive. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont, USA. Lord Clive by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter One. Lord Clive, January eighteen forty. The life of Robert Lord Clive, collected from the family papers, communicated by the Earl of Powis, by Major General Sir John Malcolm, K.C.B., three volumes, octavo, London, 1836. We have always thought it strange that while the history of the Spanish Empire in America is familiarly known to all the nations of Europe, the great actions of our countrymen in the East should, even among ourselves, excite little interest every schoolboy knows who imprisoned montezuma and who strangled atahualpa but we doubt whether one in ten even among english gentlemen of highly cultivated minds can tell you who won the battle of buxar who perpetrated the massacre of patna whether suja dowla ruled in oud or in Tranvacore, or whether holkar was a hindu or a mussulman Yet the victories of Cortes were gained over savages who had no letters, who were ignorant of the use of metals, who had not broken a single animal to labor, who wielded no better weapons than those which could be made out of sticks, flints, and fish bones, who regarded a horse soldier as a monster, half man and half beast, who took a harquousier for a sorcerer, able to scatter the thunder and lightning of the skies. The people of India, when we subdued them, were ten times as numerous as the Americans whom the Spaniards vanquished, and were at the same time quite as highly civilized as the victorious Spaniards. They had reared cities larger and fairer than Saragossa or Toledo, and buildings more beautiful and costly than the Cathedral of Seville. They could show bankers richer than the richest firms of Barcelona or Cadiz, viceroys whose splendor far surpassed that of Ferdinand the Catholic, myriads of cavalry and long trains of artillery, which would have astonished the great captain. It might have been expected that every Englishman who takes an interest in any part of history would be curious to know how a handful of his countrymen, separated from their home by an immense ocean, subjugated in the course of a few years one of the greatest empires in the world. Yet, unless we greatly err, this subject is to most readers not only insipid, but positively distasteful. Perhaps the fault lies partly with the historians. Mr. Mill's book, though it has undoubtedly great and rare merit, is not sufficiently animated and picturesque to attract those who read for amusement. Orme, inferior to no English historian in style and power of painting, is minute even to tediousness. In one volume he allots on an average a closely printed quarto page to the events of every forty-eight hours. The consequence is that his narrative, though one of the most authentic and one of the most finely written in our language, has never been very popular, and is now scarcely ever read. We fear that the volumes before us will not much attract those readers whom Orme and Mill have repelled. The materials placed at the disposal of Sir John Malcolm by the late Lord Powis were indeed of great value, but we cannot say that they have been very skilfully worked up. It would, however, be unjust to criticise with severity a work which, if the author had lived to complete and revise it, would probably have been improved by condensation and by a better arrangement we are more disposed to perform the pleasing duty of expressing our gratitude to the noble family to which the public owes so much useful and curious information. The effect of the book, even when we make the largest allowance for the partiality of those who have furnished and those who have digested the materials, is, on the whole, greatly to raise the character of Lord Clive. We are far indeed from sympathizing with Sir John Malcolm, whose love passes the love of biographers, and who can see nothing but wisdom and justice in the actions of his idol. But we are at least equally far from concurring in the severe judgment of Mr. Mill, who seems to us to show less discrimination in his account of Clive than in any other part of his valuable work. 
Clive, like most men who were born with strong passions and tried by strong temptations, committed great faults. But every person who takes a fair and enlightened view of his whole career must admit that our island, so fertile in heroes and statesmen, has scarcely ever produced a man more truly great either in arms or in council. The Clives had been settled ever since the twelfth century, on an estate of no great value, near Market Drayton in Shropshire. In the reign of George I, this moderate but ancient inheritance was possessed by Mr. Richard Clive, who seems to have been a plain man of no great tact or capacity. He had been bred to the law, and divided his time between professional business and the avocations of a small proprietor. He married a lady from Manchester, of the name of Gaskell, and became the father of a very numerous family. His eldest son, Robert, the founder of the British Empire in India, was born at the old seat of his ancestors on the 29th of September, 1725. Some lineaments of the character of the man were early discerned in the child. There remain letters written by his relations when he was in his seventh year, and from these letters it appears that even at that early age his strong will and his fiery passions, sustained by a constitutional intrepidity which sometimes seemed hardly compatible with soundness of mind, had begun to cause great uneasiness to his family. Fighting, says one of his uncles, to which he is out of measure addicted, gives his temper such a fierceness and imperiousness that he flies out on every trifling occasion. The old people of the neighbourhood still remember to have heard from their parents how Bob Clive climbed to the top of the lofty steeple of Market Drayton, and with what terror the inhabitants saw him seated on a stone spout near the summit. They also relate how he formed all the idle lads of the town into a kind of predatory army, and compelled the shopkeepers to submit to a tribute of apples and halfpence, in consideration of which he guaranteed the security of their windows. He was sent from school to school, making very little progress in his learning, and gaining for himself everywhere the character of an exceedingly naughty boy. One of his masters, it is said, was sagacious enough to prophesy that the idle lad would make a great figure in the world. But the general opinion seems to have been that poor Robert was a dunce, if not a reprobate. His family expected nothing good from such slender parts and such headstrong temper. It is not strange, therefore, that they gladly accepted for him, when he was in his eighteenth year, a writership in the service of the East India Company, and shipped him off to make a fortune or to die of a fever at Madras. Far different were the prospects of Clive from those of the youths whom the East India College now annually sends to the presidencies of our Asiatic Empire. The company was then purely a trading corporation. Its territory consisted of a few square miles, for which rent was paid to the native governments. Its troops were scarcely numerous enough to man the batteries of three or four ill-constructed forts, which had been erected for the protection of the warehouses. The natives who composed a considerable part of these little garrisons had not yet been trained in the discipline of Europe, and were armed, some with swords and shields, some with bows and arrows. The business of the servant of the company was not, as now, to conduct the judicial, financial, and diplomatic business of a great country, but to take stock, to make advances to weavers, to ship cargoes, and above all to keep an eye on private traders who dared to infringe the monopoly. The younger clerks were so miserably paid that they could scarcely subsist without incurring debt. The elder enriched themselves by trading on their own account, and those who lived to rise to the top of the service often accumulated considerable fortunes. Madras, to which Clive had been appointed, was at this time perhaps the first in importance of the company's settlements. In the preceding century, Fort St. George had arisen on a barren spot beaten by a raging surf, and in the neighbourhood a town, inhabited by many thousands of natives, had sprung up as towns spring up in the east, with the rapidity of the prophet's gourd. There were already in the suburbs many white villas, each surrounded by its garden, whither the wealthy agents of the company retired after the labours of the desk and the warehouse, 
to enjoy the cool breeze which springs up at sunset from the bay of bengal the habits of these mercantile grandees appear to have been more profuse luxurious and ostentatious than those of the high judicial and political functionaries who have succeeded them but comfort was far less understood many devices which now mitigate the heat of the climate preserve health and prolong life were unknown there was far less intercourse with europe than at present the voyage by the cape which in our time has often been performed within three months was then very seldom accomplished in six and was sometimes prolonged to more than a year consequently the anglo-indian was then much more estranged from his country much more addicted to oriental usages and much less fitted to mix in society after his return to europe than the anglo-indian of the present day within the fort and its precinct the english exercised by permission of the native government an extensive authority such as every great indian landowner exercised within his own domain but they had never dreamed of claiming independent power the surrounding country was ruled by the nabob of the carnatic a deputy of the viceroy of the deccan commonly called the nizam who was himself only a deputy of the mighty prince designated by our ancestors as the great mogul those names once so august and formidable still remain there is still a nabob of the carnatic who lives on a pension allowed to him by the english out of the revenues of the provinces which his ancestors ruled there is still a nizam whose capital is overawed by a british cantonment and to whom a british resident gives under the name of advice commands which are not to be disputed there is still a mogul who is permitted to play at holding courts and receiving petitions but who has less power to help or hurt than the youngest civil servant of the company clive's voyage was unusually tedious even for that age the ship remained some months at the brazils where the young adventurer picked up some knowledge of portuguese and spent all his pocket money he did not arrive in india till more than a year after he had left england his situation at madras was most painful his funds were exhausted his pay was small he had contracted debts he was wretchedly lodged no small calamity in a climate which can be made tolerable to a european only by spacious and well-placed apartments he had been furnished with letters of recommendation to a gentleman who might have assisted him but when he landed at fort st george he found that this gentleman had sailed for england the lad's shy and haughty disposition withheld him from introducing himself to strangers he was several months in india before he became acquainted with a single family the climate affected his health and spirits his duties were of a kind ill suited to his ardent and daring character he pined for his home and in his letters to his relations expressed his feelings in language softer and more pensive than we should have expected either from the waywardness of his boyhood or from the inflexible sternness of his later years i have not enjoyed says he one happy day since i left my native country and again i must confess at intervals when i think of my dear native england it affects me in a very peculiar manner if i should be so far blessed as to revisit again my own country but more especially manchester the centre of all my wishes all that i could hope or desire for would be presented before me in one view one solace he found of the most respectable kind the governor possessed a good library and permitted clive to have access to it the young man devoted much of his leisure to reading and acquired at this time almost all the knowledge of books that he ever possessed as a boy he had been too idle as a man he soon became too busy for literary pursuits but neither climate nor poverty neither study nor the sorrows of a homesick exile could tame the desperate audacity of his spirit he behaved to his official superiors as he had behaved to his schoolmasters and he was several times in danger of losing his situation twice while residing in the writer's buildings he attempted to destroy himself and twice the pistol which he snapped at his own head failed to go off the circumstance it is said affected him as a similar escape affected wallenstein 
after satisfying himself that the pistol was really well loaded he burst forth into an exclamation that surely he was reserved for something great about this time an event which at first seemed likely to destroy all his hopes in life suddenly opened before him a new path to eminence europe had been during some years distracted by the war of the austrian succession george the second was the steady ally of maria theresa the house of bourbon took the opposite side though england was even then the first of maritime powers she was not as she has since become more than a match on the sea for all the nations of the world together and she found it difficult to maintain a conquest against the united navies of france and spain in the eastern seas france obtained the ascendancy la bourdonnais governor of mauritius a man of eminent talents and virtues conducted an expedition to the continent of india in spite of the opposition of the british fleet landed assembled an army appeared before madras and compelled the town and fort to capitulate the keys were delivered up the french colours were displayed on fort st george and the contents of the company's warehouses were seized as a prize of war by the conquerors it was stipulated by the capitulation that the english inhabitants should be prisoners of war on parole and that the town should remain in the hands of the french till it should be ransomed la bourdonnais pledged his honour that only a moderate ransom should be required but the success of la bourdonnais had awakened the jealousy of his countryman duplay governor of pondicherry duplay moreover had already begun to revolve gigantic schemes with which the restoration of madras to the english was by no means compatible he declared that la bourdonnais had gone beyond his powers that conquests made by the French arms on the continent of India were at the disposal of the governor of Pondicherry alone, and that Madras should be razed to the ground. La Bourdonnais was compelled to yield. The anger which the breach of the capitulation excited among the English was increased by the ungenerous manner in which Duplay treated the principal servants of the company. The governor and several of the first gentlemen of Fort St. George were carried under a guard to Pondicherry, and conducted through the town in a triumphal procession under the eyes of fifty thousand spectators. It was with reason thought that this gross violation of public faith absolved the inhabitants of Madras from the engagements into which they entered with La Bourdonnais. Clive fled from the town by night in the disguise of a Mussulman, and took refuge at Fort St. David, one of the small English settlements subordinate to Madras. The circumstances in which he was now placed naturally led him to adopt a profession better suited to his restless and intrepid spirit than the business of examining packages and casting accounts. He solicited and obtained an ensign's commission in the service of the company, and at twenty-one entered on his military career. His personal courage, of which he had, while still a writer, given signal proof by a desperate duel with a military bully who was the terror of Fort St. David, speedily made him conspicuous even among hundreds of brave men. He soon began to show in his new calling other qualities which had not before been discerned in him, judgment, sagacity, deference to legitimate authority. He distinguished himself highly in several operations against the French, and was particularly noticed by Major Lawrence, who was then considered as the ablest British officer in India. Clive had been only a few months in the army, when intelligence arrived that peace had been concluded between Great Britain and France. Duplay was in consequence compelled to restore Madras to the English company, and the young ensign was at liberty to resume his former business. He did indeed return for a short time to his desk. He again quitted it in order to assist Major Lawrence in some petty hostilities with the natives, and then again returned to it. While he was thus wavering between a military and a commercial life, events took place which decided his choice. The politics of India assumed a new aspect. There was peace between the English and the French crowns but there arose between the English and French companies trading to the east a war most eventful and important, 
a war in which the prize was nothing less than the magnificent inheritance of the house of tamerlan the empire which Babur and his Mongols reared in the 16th century was long one of the most extensive and splendid in the world. In no European kingdom was so large a population subject to a single prince, or so large a revenue poured into the treasury. The beauty and magnificence of the buildings erected by the sovereigns of Hindustan amazed even travellers who had seen St. Peter's. The innumerable retinues and gorgeous decorations which surrounded the throne of Delhi dazzled even eyes which were accustomed to the pomp of Versailles. Some of the great viceroys who held their posts by virtue of commissions from the Mogul ruled as many subjects as the King of France or the Emperor of Germany. Even the deputies of these deputies might well rank, as to extent of territory and amount of revenue, with the Grand Duke of Tuscany or the Elector of Saxony. There can be little doubt that this great empire, powerful and prosperous as it appears on a superficial view, was yet, even in its best days, far worse governed than the worst governed parts of Europe now are. The administration was tainted with all the vices of Oriental despotism, and with all the vices inseparable from the domination of race over race. The conflicting pretensions of the princes of the royal house produced a long series of crimes and public disasters. Ambitious lieutenants of the sovereign sometimes aspired to independence. Fierce tribes of Hindus, impatient of a foreign yoke, frequently withheld tribute, repelled the armies of the government from the mountain fastnesses, and poured down in arms on the cultivated plains. In spite, however, of much constant maladministration, in spite of occasional convulsions which shook the whole frame of society, this great monarchy on the whole retained during some generations an outward appearance of unity, majesty, and energy. But throughout the long reign of Aurangzeb, the state, notwithstanding all that the vigour and policy of the prince could effect, was hastening to dissolution. After his death, which took place in the year 1707, the ruin was fearfully rapid. Violent shocks from without cooperated with an incurable decay which was fast proceeding within, and in a few years the empire had undergone utter decomposition. The history of the successes of Theodosius bears no small analogy to that of the successes of Aurangzeb, but perhaps the fall of the Carlovingians furnishes the nearest parallel to the fall of the Mughals. Charlemagne was scarcely interred when the imbecility and the disputes of his descendants began to bring contempt on themselves and destruction on their subjects. The wide dominion of the Franks was severed into a thousand pieces. Nothing more than a nominal dignity was left to the abject heirs of an illustrious name, Charles the Bald and Charles the Fat and Charles the Simple. Fierce invaders, differing from each other in race, language, and religion, flocked, as if by concert, from the farthest corners of the earth to plunder provinces which the government could no longer defend. The pirates of the northern sea extended their ravages from the Elbe to the Pyrenees, and at length fixed their seat in the rich valley of the Seine. The Hungarian, in whom the trembling monks fancied that they recognized the Gog or Magog of prophecy, carried back the plunder of the cities of Lombardy to the depths of the Pannonian forests. The Saracen ruled in Sicily, desolated the fertile plains of Campania, and spread terror even to the walls of Rome. In the midst of these sufferings a great internal change passed upon the empire. The corruption of death began to ferment into new forms of life. While the great body as a whole was torpid and passive, every separate member began to feel with a sense and to move with an energy all its own. Just here, in the most barren and dreary tract of European history, all feudal privileges, all modern nobility, take their source. It is to this point that we trace the power of those princes who, nominally vassals but really independent, long governed with the titles of dukes, marquises, and counts almost every part of the dominions which had obeyed Charlemagne. Such, or nearly such, was the change which passed on the Mughal Empire during the forty years which followed the death of Aurangzeb. A succession of nominal sovereigns, sunk in indolence and debauchery, sauntered away life in secluded palaces, 
chewing bang, fondling concubines, and listening to buffoons. A succession of ferocious invaders descended through the western passes to prey on the defenceless wealth of Hindustan. A Persian conqueror crossed the Indus, marched through the gates of Delhi, and bore away in triumph those treasures of which the magnificence had astounded Roe and Bernier, the peacock throne on which the richest jewels of Golconda had been disposed by the most skilful hands of Europe, and the inestimable mountain of light which after many strange vicissitudes lately shone in the bracelet of Runjeet Singh, and is now destined to adorn the hideous idol of Arissa. The Afghan soon followed to complete the work of the devastation which the Persian had begun. The warlike tribes of Rajputana threw off the Mussulman yoke. A band of mercenary soldiers occupied Royal Kund. The Sikhs ruled the Indus. The Jout spread dismay along the Jumna. The highlands which border on the western seacoast of India poured forth a yet more formidable race, a race which was long the terror of every native power, and which, after many desperate and doubtful struggles, yielded only to the fortune and genius of England. It was under the reign of Aurangzeb that this wild clan of plunderers first descended from their mountains, and soon after his death every corner of his wide empire learned to tremble at the mighty name of the Marathas. Many fertile viceroyalties were entirely subdued by them. Their dominion stretched across the peninsula from sea to sea. Maratha captains reigned at Pune, at Gwalior in Gujarat, in Berar and in Tanjore. Nor did they, though they had become great sovereigns, therefore cease to be freebooters. They still retained the predatory habits of their forefathers, Every region which was not subject to their rule was wasted by their incursions. Wherever their kettle drums were heard, the peasant threw his bag of rice on his shoulder, hid his small savings in his girdle, and fled with his wife and children to the mountains or the jungles, to the milder neighborhood of the hyena and the tiger. Many provinces redeemed their harvests by payment of an annual ransom. Even the wretched phantom who still bore the imperial title stooped to pay this ignominious blackmail. The campfires of one rapacious leader were seen from the walls of the palace of Delhi. Another, at the head of his innumerable cavalry, descended year after year on the rice fields of Bengal. Even the European factors trembled for their magazines. Less than a hundred years ago, it was thought necessary to fortify Calcutta against the horsemen of Berar, and the name of the Maratha ditch still preserves the memory of the danger. Wherever the viceroys of the Mughal retained authority, they became sovereigns. They might still acknowledge in words the superiority of the House of Tamerlane, as a Count of Flanders or a Duke of Burgundy might have acknowledged the superiority of the most helpless driveller among the later Carlovingians. They might occasionally send to their titular sovereign a complimentary present, or solicit from him a title of honour. In truth, however, they were no longer lieutenants removable at pleasure, but independent hereditary princes. In this way originated those great Mussulman houses, which formerly ruled Bengal and the Carnatic, and those which still, though in a state of vassalage, exercise some of the powers of royalty at Lucknow and Hyderabad. In what was this confusion to end? Was the strife to continue during centuries? Was it to terminate in the rise of another great monarchy? Was the Mussulman or the Maratha to be the lord of India? Was another Babur to descend from the mountains and to lead the hardy tribes of Kabul and Khorasan against a wealthier and less warlike race? None of these events seemed improbable, but scarcely any man, however sagacious, would have thought it possible that a trading company, separated from India by 15,000 miles of sea, and possessing in India only a few acres for purposes of commerce, would, in less than a hundred years, spread its empire from Cape Cormoran to the eternal snow of the Himalayas would compel Maratha and Mohammedan to forget their mutual feuds in common subjection, would tame down even those wild races which had resisted the most powerful of the Mughals, and having united under its laws a hundred millions of subjects, would carry its victorious arms far to the caste of Buramputa and far to the west of the Hydaspes, 
dictate terms of peace at the gates of Ava, and seat its vassal on the throne of Kandahar. End of chapter 1《Clive》by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The man who first saw that it was possible to found a European empire on the ruins of the Mogul monarchy was Dupleix. His restless, capacious, and inventive mind had formed this scheme at a time when the ablest servants of the English company were busied only about invoices and bills of lading. Nor had he only proposed to himself the end he had also a just and distinct view of the means by which it was to be attained. He clearly saw that the greatest force which the princes of India could bring into the field would be no match for a small body of men trained in the discipline and guided by the tactics of the West. He saw also that the natives of India might, under European commanders, be formed into armies such as Saxe or Frederick would be proud to command. He was perfectly aware that the most easy and convenient way in which a European adventurer could exercise sovereignty in India was to govern the motions and to speak through the mouth of some glittering puppet dignified by the title of Nabob or Nizam. The arts both of war and policy which a few years later were employed with such signal success by the English were first understood and practiced by this ingenious and aspiring Frenchman. The situation of India was such that scarcely any aggression could be without a pretext, either in old laws or in recent practice. All rights were in a state of utter uncertainty, and the Europeans who took part in the disputes of the natives confounded the confusion by applying to Asiatic politics the public law of the West and analogies drawn from the feudal system. If it was convenient to treat the Nabob as an independent prince, there was an excellent plea for doing so. He was independent, in fact. If it was convenient to treat him as a mere deputy of the court of Delhi, there was no difficulty, for he was so in theory. If it was convenient to consider his office as an hereditary dignity, or as a dignity held during life only, or as a dignity held only during the good pleasure of the Mogul, arguments and precedents might be found for every one of those views. The party who had the air of Babur in their hands represented him as the undoubted, the legitimate, the absolute sovereign, whom all subordinate authorities were bound to obey. The party against whom his name was used did not want plausible pretext for maintaining that the empire was in fact dissolved, and that though it might be decent to treat the Mogul with respect as a venerable relic of an order of things which had passed away, it was absurd to regard him as the real master of Hindustan. In the year 1748 died one of the most powerful of the new masters of India, the great Nizam al-Mulk, viceroy of the Deccan. His authority descended to his son, Nazir Jung. Of the provinces subject to this high functionary, the Carnatic was the wealthiest and the most extensive. It was governed by an ancient nabob whose name the English corrupted into Anaverdi Khan. But there were pretenders to the government both of the viceroyalty and of the subordinate province. Mizafar Jung, a grandson of Nizam al-Mulk, appeared as the competitor of Nazir Jung. Chunda Sahib, son-in-law of a former nabob of the Carnatic, disputed the title of Anaverdi Khan. In the unsettled state of Indian law, it was easy both for Mizarfar Jung and Chunda Sahib to make out something like a claim of right. In a society altogether disorganized, they had no difficulty in finding greedy adventurers to follow their standards. They united their interests, invaded the Carnatic, and applied for assistance to the French, whose fame had been raised by their success against the English in a recent war on the coasts of Coromandel. Nothing could have happened more pleasing to the subtle and ambitious Dupleix. To make a nabob of the Carnatic, to make a viceroy of the Deccan, to rule under their names the whole of southern India, this was indeed an attractive prospect. He allied himself with the pretenders, and sent four hundred French soldiers and two thousand sepoys 
disciplined after the European fashion, to the assistance of his confederates. A battle was fought. The French distinguished themselves greatly. Anaverdi Khan was defeated and slain. His son, Muhammad Ali, who was afterwards well known in England as the Nabob of Arcot, and who owes to the eloquence of Burke a most unenviable immortality, fled with a scanty remnant of his army to Trichnopoly, and the conquerors became at once masters of almost every part of the Carnatic. This was but the beginning of the greatness of Duplay. After some months of fighting, negotiation and intrigue, his ability and good fortune seemed to have prevailed everywhere. Nazir Jung perished by the hands of his own followers, Mizarfa Jung was master of the Deccan, and the triumph of French arms and French policy was complete. At Pondicherry all was exultation and festivity. Salutes were fired from the batteries, and Te Deum sung in the churches. The new Nizam came thither to visit his allies, and the ceremony of his installation was performed there with great pomp. Duplay, dressed in the garb worn by Mohammedans of the highest rank, entered the town in the same palaquin with the Nizam, and in the pageant which followed took precedence of all the court. He was declared Governor of India from the river Krishna to Cape Cormoran, a country about as large as France, with authority superior even to that of Chunda Sahib. He was entrusted with the command of seven thousand cavalry. It was announced that no mint would be suffered to exist in the Carnatic except that at Pondicherry. A large portion of the treasures which former viceroys of the Deccan had accumulated had found its way into the coffers of the French governor. It was rumoured that he had received two hundred thousand pounds sterling in money, besides many valuable jewels. In fact, there could scarcely be any limit to his gains. He now ruled thirty millions of people with almost absolute power. No honour or emolument could be obtained from the government but by his intervention. No petition, unless signed by him, was perused by the Nizam. Mirzafa Jung survived his elevation only a few months, but another prince of the same house was raised to the throne by French influence and ratified all the promises of his predecessor. Duplay was now the greatest potentate in India. His countrymen boasted that his name was mentioned with awe even in the chambers of the palace of Delhi. The native population looked with amazement on the progress which, in the short space of four years, a European adventurer had made towards dominion in Asia. Nor was the vainglorious Frenchman content with the reality of power. He loved to display his greatness with arrogant ostentation before the eyes of his subjects and of his rivals. Near the spot where his policy had obtained its chief triumph by the fall of Nazir Jung and the elevation of Mir Zafa, he determined to erect a column on the four sides of which four pompous inscriptions in four languages should proclaim his glory to all the nations of the East. Medals stamped with emblems of his successes were buried beneath the foundations of his stately pillar, and round it arose a town bearing the haughty name of Duplay Fatihabad, which is, being interpreted, the city of the victory of Duplay. The English had made some feeble and irresolute attempts to stop the rapid and brilliant career of the rival company, and continued to recognize Muhammad Ali as Nabob of the Carnatic. But the dominions of Muhammad Ali consisted of Trichinopoly alone, and Trichinopoly was now invested by Chunda Sahib and his French auxiliaries. To raise the siege seemed impossible. The small force which was then at Madras had no commander. Major Lawrence had returned to England, and not a single officer of established character remained in the settlement. The natives had learned to look with contempt on the mighty nation which was soon to conquer and to rule them. They had seen the French colours flying on Fort St. George, they had seen the chiefs of the English factory led in triumph through the streets of Pondicherry, they had seen the arms and councils of Duplay everywhere successful, while their opposition which the authorities of Madras had made to his progress had served only to expose their own weakness and to heighten his glory. At this moment the valour and genius of an obscure English youth suddenly turned the tide of fortune. Clive was now twenty-five years old. 
After first hesitating for some time between a military and a commercial life, he had at length been placed in a post which partook of both characters, that of commissary to the troops with the rank of captain. The present emergency called forth all his powers. He represented to his superiors that unless some vigorous effort were made, Trichinopoly would fall, the house of Annaverdi Khan would perish, and the French would become the real masters of the whole peninsula of India. It was absolutely necessary to strike some daring blow. If an attack were made on Arcot, the capital of the Carnatic, and the favourite residence of the Nabobs, it was not impossible that the siege of Trichinopoly would be raised. The heads of the English settlement, now thoroughly alarmed by the success of Duplay, and apprehensive that in the event of a new war between France and Great Britain, Madras would be instantly taken and destroyed, approved of Clive's plans, and entrusted the execution of it to himself. The young captain was put at the head of two hundred English soldiers, and three hundred sepoys, armed and disciplined after the European fashion. Of the eight officers who commanded this little force under him, only two had ever been in action, and four of the eight were factors of the company, whom Clive's example had induced to offer their services. The weather was stormy, but Clive pushed on, through thunder, lightning, and rain, to the gates of Arcot. The garrison, in a panic, evacuated the fort, and the English entered it without a blow. But Clive well knew that he should not be suffered to retain undisturbed possession of his conquest. He instantly began to collect provisions, to throw up works, and to make preparations for sustaining a siege. The garrison, which had fled at his approach, had now recovered from its dismay, and having been swelled by large reinforcements from the neighbourhood to a force of three thousand men, encamped close to the town. At dead of night, Clive marched out of the fort, attacked the camp by surprise, slew great numbers, dispersed the rest, and returned to his quarters without having lost a single man. The intelligence of these events was soon carried to Chunda Sahib, who with his French allies was besieging Trichinopoly. He immediately detached four thousand men from his camp and sent them to Arcot. They were speedily joined by the remains of the force which Clive had lately scattered. They were further strengthened by two thousand men from Velour, and by a still more important reinforcement of a hundred and fifty French soldiers whom Duplay dispatched from Pondicherry. The whole of his army, amounting to about ten thousand men, was under command of Raja Sahib, son of Chunda Sahib. Raja Sahib proceeded to invest the fort of Arcot, which seemed quite incapable of sustaining a siege. The walls were ruinous, the ditches dry, the ramparts too narrow to admit the guns, the battlements too low to protect the soldiers. The little garrison had been greatly reduced by casualties. It now consisted of a hundred and twenty Europeans and two hundred sepoys. Only four officers were left, the stock of provisions was scanty, and the commander who had to conduct the defence under circumstances so discouraging was a young man of five and twenty who had been bred a bookkeeper. During fifty days the siege went on. During fifty days the young captain maintained the defence with a firmness, vigilance and ability which would have done honour to the oldest marshal in Europe. The breach, however, increased day by day. The garrison began to feel the pressure of hunger. Under such circumstances, any troop so scantily provided with officers might have been expected to show signs of insubordination, and the danger was peculiarly great in a force composed of men differing widely from each other in extraction, colour, language, manners, and religion. But the devotion of the little band to its chief surpassed anything that is related of the Tenth Legion of Caesar or of the Old Guard of Napoleon. The sepoys came to Clive, not to complain of their scanty fare, but to propose that all the grain should be given to the Europeans, who required more nourishment than the natives of Asia. The thin gruel, they said, which was strained away from the rice, would suffice for themselves. History contains no more touching instance of military fidelity or of the influence of a commanding mind. An attempt made by the government of Madras to relieve the place had failed, but there was hope from another quarter. 
a body of six thousand Marathas, half soldiers, half robbers, under the command of a chief named Morari Ro, had been hired to assist Mohammed Ali. But thinking the French power irresistible and the triumph of Chunda Sahib certain, they had hitherto remained inactive on the frontiers of the Carnatic. The fame of the defence of Arcot roused them from their torpor. Morari Rowe declared that he had never before believed that Englishmen could fight, but he would willingly help them since he saw that they had spirit to help themselves. Raja Sahib learned that the Marathas were in motion. It was necessary for him to be expeditious. He first tried negotiation. He offered large bribes to Clive, which were rejected with scorn. He vowed that if his proposals were not accepted, he would instantly storm the fort and put every man in it to the sword. Clive told him in reply, with characteristic haughtiness, that his father was an usurper, that his army was a rabble, and that he would do well to think twice before he sent such poltroons into a breach defended by English soldiers. Rajah Sahib determined to storm the fort. The day was well suited to a bold military enterprise. It was the great Mohammedan festival which is sacred to the memory of Hussein, the son of Ali. The history of Islam contains nothing more touching than the event which gave rise to that solemnity. The mournful legend relates how the chief of the Fatimites, when all his brave followers had perished round him, drank his last draught of water and uttered his latest prayer, how the assassins carried his head in triumph, how the tyrant smote the lifeless lips with his staff, and how a few old men recollected with tears that they had seen those lips pressed to the lips of the prophet of God. After the lapse of near twelve centuries, the recurrence of this solemn season excites the fiercest and saddest emotions in the bosoms of the devout Moslem of India. They work themselves up to such agonies of rage and lamentation that some, it is said, have given up the ghost from the mere effect of mental excitement. They believe that whoever during this festival falls in arms against the infidels, atones by his death for all the sins of his life, and passes at once into the garden of the Huris. It was at this time that Rajah Sahib determined to assault Arcot. Stimulating drugs were employed to aid the effect of religious zeal, and the besiegers, drunk with enthusiasm, drunk with bang, rushed furiously to the attack. Clive had received secret intelligence of the design, had made his arrangements, and, exhausted by fatigue, had thrown himself on his bed. He was awakened by the alarm and was instantly at his post. The enemy advanced, driving before them elephants, whose foreheads were armed with iron plates. It was expected that the gates would yield to the shock of these living battering rams. But the huge beasts no sooner felt the English musket balls than they turned round and rushed furiously away, trampling on the multitude which had urged them forward. A raft was launched on the water which filled one part of the ditch. Clive, perceiving that his gunners at that post did not understand their business, took the management of a piece of artillery himself, and cleared the raft in a few minutes. When the moat was dry, the assailants mounted with great boldness, but they were received with a fire so heavy and so well directed that it soon quelled the courage even of fanaticism and of intoxication. The rear ranks of the English kept the front ranks supplied with a constant succession of loaded muskets, and every shot told on the living mass below. After three desperate onsets, the besiegers retired behind the ditch. The struggle lasted about an hour. Four hundred of the assailants fell. The garrison lost only five or six men. The besieged passed an anxious night, looking for a renewal of the attack. But when the day broke, the enemy were no more to be seen. They had retired, leaving to the English several guns and a large quantity of ammunition. The news was received at Fort St. George with transports of joy and pride. Clive was justly regarded as a man equal to any command. Two hundred English soldiers and seven hundred sepoys were sent to him, and with this force he instantly commenced offensive operations. He took the force of Timory, effected a junction with the division of Morari Rao's army, and hastened by forced marches to attack Rajah Sahib, who was at the head of about five thousand men, of whom three hundred were French. 
The action was sharp, but Clive gained a complete victory. The military chest of Rajah Sahib fell into the hands of the conquerors. Six hundred sepoys who had served in the enemy's army came over to Clive's quarters and were taken into the British service. Conjeveram surrendered without a blow. The governor of Arni deserted Chunda Sahib and recognized the title of Muhammad Ali. Had the entire direction of the war been entrusted to Clive, it would probably have been brought to a speedy close. But the timidity and incapacity which appeared in all the movements of the English, except where he was personally present, protected the struggle. The Marathas muttered that his soldiers were of a different race from the British whom they found elsewhere. The effect of this languor was that in no long time Rajah Sahib, at the head of a considerable army, in which were four hundred French troops, appeared almost under the guns of Fort St. George, and laid waste the villas and gardens of the gentlemen of the English settlement. But he was again encountered and defeated by Clive. More than a hundred of the French were killed or taken, a loss more serious than that of thousands of natives. The victorious army marched from the field of battle to Fort St. David. On the road lay the city of the victory of Duplay and the stately monument which was designed to commemorate the triumphs of France in the east. Clive ordered both the city and the monument to be razed to the ground. He was induced, we believe, to take this step, not by personal or national malevolence, but by a just and profound policy. The town and its pompous name, the pillar and its vaunting inscriptions, were among the devices by which Duplay had laid the public mind of India under a spell. This spell it was Clive's business to break. The natives had been taught that France was confessedly the first power in Europe, and that the English did not presume to dispute her supremacy. No measure could be more effectual for the removing of this delusion than the public and solemn demolition of the French trophies. The government of Madras, encouraged by these events, determined to send a strong detachment under Clive to reinforce the garrison of Trichinopoly. But just at this juncture, Major Lawrence arrived from England and assumed the chief command. From the waywardness and impatience of control which had characterized Clive, both at school and in the counting-house, it might have been expected that he would not, after such achievements, act with zeal and good humor in a subordinate capacity. But Lawrence had early treated him with kindness, and it is bare justice to Clive to say that proud and overbearing as he was, kindness was never thrown away upon him. He cheerfully placed himself under the orders of his old friend, and exerted himself as strenuously in the second post as he could have done in the first. Lawrence well knew the value of such assistance, though himself gifted with no intellectual faculty higher than plain good sense, he fully appreciated the powers of his brilliant coadjutor. Though he had made a methodical study of military tactics, and like all men regularly bred to a profession, was disposed to look with disdain on interlopers, he had yet liberality enough to acknowledge that Clive was an exception to common rules. Some people, he wrote, are pleased to term Captain Clive fortunate and lucky, but in my opinion, from the knowledge I have of the gentleman, he deserved and might expect from his conduct everything as it fell out, a man of an undaunted resolution, of a cool temper, and of a presence of mind which never left him in the greatest danger, born a soldier. For, without a military education of any sort, or much conversing with any of the profession, from his judgment and good sense, he led an army like an experienced officer and a brave soldier, and with a prudence that certainly warranted success. The French had no commander to oppose to the two friends. Duplay, not inferior in talents for negotiation and intrigue to any European who was born apart in the revolutions of India, was ill qualified to direct in person military operations. He had not been bred a soldier, and had no inclination to become one. His enemies accused him of personal cowardice, and he defended himself in a strain worthy of Captain Bobadil. He kept away from shot, he said, because silence and tranquillity were propitious to his genius, and he found it difficult to pursue his meditation amidst the noise of firearms. 
he was thus under the necessity of entrusting to others the execution of his great warlike designs and he bitterly complained that he was ill served he had indeed been assisted by one officer of eminent merit the celebrated bussy but bussy had marched northward with the nizam and was fully employed in looking after his own interests and those of france at the court of that prince among the officers who remained with Duplay, there was not a single man of capacity, and many of them were boys at whose ignorance and folly the common soldiers laughed. The English triumphed everywhere. The besiegers of Trichinopoly were themselves besieged and compelled to capitulate. Chunda Sahib fell into the hands of the Mahrattas and was put to death at the instigation probably of his competitor, Muhammad Ali. The spirit of Duplay, however, was unconquerable, and his resources inexhaustible. From his employers in Europe he no longer received help or countenance, they condemned his policy, they gave him no pecuniary assistance, they sent him for troops only the sweepings of the galleys, yet still he persisted, intrigued, bribed, promised, lavished his private fortune, strained his credit, procured new diplomas from Delhi, raised up new enemies to the government of Madras on every side, and found tools even among the allies of the English company. But all was in vain. Slowly but steadily the power of Britain continued to increase, and that of France to decline. The health of Clive had never been good during his residence in India, and his constitution was now so much impaired that he determined to return to England. Before his departure he undertook a service of considerable difficulty, and performed it with his usual vigour and dexterity. The forts of Covalong and Chingleput were occupied by French garrisons. It was determined to send a force against them, but the only force available for this purpose was of such a description that no officer but Clive would risk his reputation by commanding it. It consisted of five hundred newly levied sepoys, and two hundred recruits who had just landed from England, and who were the worst and lowest wretches that the company's crimps could pick up in the flash houses of London. Clive, ill and exhausted as he was, undertook to make an army of this undisciplined rabble, and marched with them to Covalong. A shot from the fort killed one of these extraordinary soldiers, on which all the rest faced about and ran away, and it was with the greatest difficulty that Clive rallied them. On another occasion, the noise of a gun terrified the sentinels so much that one of them was found some hours later at the bottom of a well. Clive gradually accustomed them to danger, and by exposing himself constantly in the most perilous situations, shamed them into courage. He at length succeeded in forming a respectable force out of his unpromising materials. Covalong fell. Clive learned that a strong detachment was marching to relieve it from Chingleput. He took measures to prevent the enemy from learning that they were too late, laid an ambuscade for them on the road, killed a hundred of them with one fire, took three hundred prisoners, pursued the fugitives to the gates of Chingleput, laid siege instantly to that fastness, reputed one of the strongest in India, and made a breach and was on the point of storming when the French commandant capitulated and retired with his men. Clive returned to Madras victorious, but in a state of health which rendered it impossible for him to remain there long. He married at this time a young lady of the name of Masculine, sister of the eminent mathematician who long held the post of astronomer royal. She is described as handsome and accomplished, and her husband's letters, it is said, contain proofs that he was devotedly attached to her. Almost immediately after the marriage, Clive embarked with his bride for England. He returned a very different person from the poor slighted boy who had been sent out ten years before to seek his fortune. He was only twenty-seven, yet his country already respected him as one of her first soldiers. There was then general peace in Europe. The Carnatic was the only part of the world where the English and French were in arms against each other. The vast schemes of Duplay had excited no small uneasiness in the city of London, and the rapid turn of fortune, which was chiefly owing to the courage and talents of Clive, had been hailed with great delight. 
The young captain was known at the India House by the honourable nickname of General Clive, and was toasted by that appellation at the feasts of the directors. On his arrival in England he found himself an object of general interest and admiration. The East India Company thanked him for his services in the warmest terms, and bestowed on him a sword set with diamonds. With rare delicacy he refused to receive this token of gratitude, unless a similar compliment were paid to his friend and commander, Lawrence. It may easily be supposed that Clive was most cordially welcomed home by his family, who were delighted by his success, though they seemed to have been hardly able to comprehend how their naughty idle Bobby had become so great a man. His father had been singularly hard of belief. Not until the news of the defence of Arcot arrived in England was the old gentleman heard to growl out that, after all, the booby had something in him. His expressions of approbation became stronger and stronger as news arrived of one brilliant exploit after another, and he was at length immoderately fond and proud of his son. Clive's relations had very substantial reasons for rejoicing at his return. Considerable sums of prize money had fallen to his share, and he had brought home a moderate fortune, part of which he expended in extricating his father from pecuniary difficulties, and in redeeming the family estate. The remainder he appears to have dissipated in the course of about two years. He lived splendidly, dressed gaily even for those times, kept a carriage and saddle-horses, and not content with these ways of getting rid of his money, resorted to the most speedy and effectual of all modes of evacuation, a contested election followed by a petition. End of chapter 2《Lord Clive》by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the time of the general election of 1754, the government was in a very singular state. There was scarcely any formal opposition. The Jacobites had been cowed by the issue of the last rebellion. The Tory party had fallen into utter contempt. It had been deserted by all the men of talents who had belonged to it and had scarcely given a symptom of life during some years. The small faction which had been held together by the influence and promises of Prince Frederick had been dispersed by his death. Almost every public man of distinguished talents in the kingdom, whatever his early connections might have been, was in office and called himself a Whig. But this extraordinary appearance of Concord was quite delusive. The administration itself was distracted by bitter enmities and conflicting pretensions. The chief object of its members was to depress and supplant each other. The Prime Minister, Newcastle, weak, timid, jealous and perfidious, was at once detested and despised by some of the most important members of his government, and by none more than by Henry Fox, the Secretary at War. This able, daring, and ambitious man seized every opportunity of crossing the First Lord of the Treasury, from whom he well knew that he had little to dread and little to hope, for Newcastle was through life equally afraid of breaking with men of parts and of promoting them. Newcastle had set his heart on returning two members for St. Michael, one of those wretched Cornish boroughs which were swept away by the Reform Act of 1832. He was opposed by Lord Sandwich, whose influence had long been paramount there, and Fox exerted himself strenuously in Sandwich's behalf. Clive, who had been introduced to Fox and very kindly received by him, was brought forward on the Sandwich interest and was returned, but a petition was presented against the return and was backed by the whole influence of the Duke of Newcastle. The case was heard according to the usage of that time before a committee of the whole house. Questions respecting elections were then considered merely as party questions. Judicial impartiality was not even affected. Sir Robert Walpole was in the habit of saying openly that in election battles there ought to be no quarter. On the present occasion the excitement was great. 
the matter really at issue was not whether clive had been properly or improperly returned but whether newcastle or fox was to be master of the new house of commons and consequently first minister the contest was long and obstinate and success seemed to lean sometimes to one side and sometimes to the other fox put forth all his rare powers of debate beat half the lawyers in the house at their own weapons and carried division after division against the whole influence of the treasury the committee decided in clive's favour but when the resolution was reported to the house things took a different course the remnant of the tory opposition contemptible as it was had yet sufficient weight to turn the scale between the nicely balanced parties of newcastle and fox newcastle the tories could only despise fox they hated as the boldest and most subtle politician and the ablest debater among the whigs as the steady friend of walpole as the devoted adherent of the duke of cumberland after wavering till the last moment they determined to vote in a body with the prime minister's friends the consequence was that the house by a small majority rescinded the decision of the committee and clive was unseated ejected from parliament and straitened in his means he naturally began to look again towards india the company and the government were eager to avail themselves of his services a treaty favourable to england had indeed been concluded in the carnatic dupleix had been superseded and had returned with the wreck of his immense fortune to europe where calumny and chicanery soon hunted him to his grave but many signs indicated that a war between france and great britain was at hand and it was therefore thought desirable to send an able commander to the company's settlements in india the directors appointed clive governor of fort st david the king gave him the commission of a lieutenant colonel in the british army and in seventeen fifty five he again sailed for asia the first service on which he was employed after his return to the east was the reduction of the stronghold of Gurea. This fortress, built on a craggy promontory, and almost surrounded by the ocean, was the den of a pirate named Angria, whose barks had long been the terror of the Arabian Gulf. Admiral Watson, who commanded the English squadron in the eastern seas, burned Angria's fleet while Clive attacked the fastness by land, the place soon fell and a booty of a hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling was divided among the conquerors after this exploit clive proceeded to his government of fort st david before he had been there two months he received intelligence which called forth all the energy of his bold and active mind of the provinces which had been subject to the house of tamerlane the wealthiest was bengal no part of india possessed such natural advantages both for agriculture and for commerce. The Ganges, rushing through a hundred channels to the sea, has formed a vast plain of rich mould, which even under the tropical sky rivals the verdure of an English April. The rice fields yield an increase such as is elsewhere unknown. Spices, sugar, vegetable oils are produced with marvellous exuberance. The rivers afford an inexhaustible supply of fish, the desolate islands along the sea-coast, overgrown by noxious vegetation and swarming with deer and tigers, supply the cultivated districts with an abundance of salt. The great stream which fertilizes the soil is, at the same time, the chief highway of eastern commerce. On its banks and on those of its tributary waters are the wealthiest marts, the most splendid capitals, and the most sacred shrines of India. The tyranny of man had for ages struggled in vain against the overflowing bounty of nature. In spite of the Mussulman despot and of the Maratha freebooter, Bengal was known through the East as the Garden of Eden, as the rich kingdom. Its population multiplied exceedingly. Distant provinces were nourished from the overflowing of its granaries, and the noble ladies of London and Paris were clothed in the delicate produce of its looms. The race by whom this rich tract was peopled, enervated by a soft climate and accustomed to peaceful employments, bore the same relation to other Asiatics which the Asiatics generally bear to the bold and energetic children of Europe. 
the castilians have a proverb that in valencia the earth is water and the men women and the description is at least equally applicable to the vast plain of the lower ganges whatever the bengali does he does languidly his favorite pursuits are sedentary he shrinks from bodily exertion and though voluble in dispute and singularly pertinacious in the war of chicane he seldom engages in a personal conflict and scarcely ever enlists as a soldier we doubt whether there be a hundred genuine bengalis in the whole army of the east india company there never perhaps existed a people so thoroughly fitted by nature and by habit for a foreign yoke the great commercial companies of europe had long possessed factories in bengal the french were settled as they still are at chandnagore on the hooghly higher up the stream the dutch held chinsura nearer to the sea the english had built fort william a church and ample warehouses rose in the vicinity a row of spacious houses belonging to the chief factors of the east india company lined the banks of the river and in the neighborhood had sprung up a large and busy native town where some hindu merchants of great opulence had fixed their abode but the tract now covered by the palaces of chowringhi contained only a few miserable huts thatched with straw a jungle abandoned to waterfowl and alligators covered the site of the present citadel and the course which is now daily crowded at sunset with the gayest equipages of calcutta for the ground on which the settlement stood the english like other great landholders paid rent to the government and they were like other great landholders permitted to exercise a certain jurisdiction within their domain the great province of bengal together with orissa and bihar had long been governed by a viceroy whom the english called aliverdi khan and who like the other viceroys of the mogul had become virtually independent he died in seventeen fifty six and the sovereignty descended to his grandson a youth under twenty years of age who bore the name of suraja daula oriental despots are perhaps the worst class of human beings and this unhappy boy was one of the worst specimens of his class his understanding was naturally feeble and his temper naturally unamiable his education had been such as would have enervated even a vigorous intellect and perverted even a generous disposition he was unreasonable because nobody ever dared to reason with him and selfish because he had never been made to feel himself dependent on the good will of others early debauchery had unnerved his body and his mind he indulged immoderately in the use of ardent spirits which inflamed his weak brain almost to madness his chosen companions were flatterers sprung from the dregs of the people and recommended by nothing but buffoonery and servility it is said that he had arrived at the last stage of human depravity where cruelty becomes pleasing for its own sake when the sight of pain as pain where no advantage is to be gained no offence punished no danger averted is an agreeable excitement it had earlier been his amusement to torture beasts and birds and when he grew up he enjoyed with still keener relish the misery of his fellow creatures from a child suraja daula had hated the english it was his whim to do so and his whims were never opposed he had also formed a very exaggerated notion of the wealth which might be obtained by plundering them and his feeble and uncultivated mind was incapable of perceiving that the riches of calcutta had they been even greater than he imagined would not compensate him for what he must lose if the european trade of which bengal was the chief seat should be driven by his violence to some other quarter pretexts for a quarrel were readily found the english in expectation of a war with france had begun to fortify their settlement without special permission from the nabob a rich native whom he longed to plunder had taken refuge at calcutta and had not been delivered up on such grounds as these suraja daula marched with a great army against fort william the servants of the company at madras had been forced by dupleix to become statesmen and soldiers those in bengal were still mere traders and were terrified and bewildered by the approaching danger 
the governor who had heard much of Suraja dowler's cruelty was frightened out of his wits jumped into a boat and took refuge in the nearest ship the military commandant thought he could not do better than follow so good an example the fort was taken after a feeble resistance and great numbers of the english fell into the hands of the conquerors the nabob seated himself with regal pomp in the principal hall of the factory and ordered mr holwell the first in rank among the prisoners to be brought before him his highness talked about the insolence of the english and grumbled at the smallness of the treasure which he had found but promised to spare their lives and retired to rest then was committed that great crime memorable for its singular atrocity memorable for the tremendous retribution by which it was followed the english captives were left to the mercy of the guards and the guards determined to secure them for the night in the prison of the garrison a chamber known by the fearful name of the black hole even for a single european malefactor that dungeon would in such a climate have been too close and narrow the space was only twenty-five feet square the air holes were small and obstructed it was the summer solstice the season when the fierce heat of bengal can scarcely be rendered tolerable to natives of england by lofty halls and by the constant waving of fans the number of the prisoners was one hundred and forty-six when they were ordered to enter the cell they imagined that the soldiers were joking and being in high spirits on account of the promise of the nabob to spare their lives they laughed and jested at the absurdity of the notion they soon discovered their mistake they expostulated they entreated but in vain the guards threatened to cut down all who hesitated the captives were driven into the cell at the point of the sword and the door was instantly shut and locked upon them nothing in history or fiction not even the story which ugolino told in the sea of everlasting ice after he had wiped his bloody lips on the scalp of his murderer approaches the horrors which were recounted by the few survivors of that night they cried for mercy they strove to burst the door Holwell, who even in that extremity retained some presence of mind, offered large bribes to the jailers, but the answer was that nothing could be done without the nabob's orders, that the nabob was asleep, and that he would be angry if any one woke him. Then the prisoners went mad with despair. They trampled each other down, fought for the places at the windows, fought for the pittance of water with which the cruel mercy of the murderers mocked their agonies, raved prayed blasphemed implored the guards to fire among them the jailers in the meantime held lights to the bars and shouted with laughter at the frantic struggles of their victims at length the tumult died away in low gaspings and moanings the day broke the nabob had slept off his debauch and permitted the door to be opened but it was some time before the soldiers could make a lane for the survivors by piling up on each side the heaps of corpses on which the burning climate had already begun to do its loathsome work when at last a passage was made twenty-three ghastly figures such as their own mothers would not have known staggered one by one out of the charnel house a pit was instantly dug the dead bodies a hundred and twenty-three in number were flung into it promiscuously and covered up but these things which after the lapse of more than eighty years cannot be told or read without horror awakened neither remorse nor pity in the bosom of the savage nabob he inflicted no punishment on the murderers he showed no tenderness to the survivors some of them indeed from whom nothing was to be got were suffered to depart but those from whom it was thought that anything could be extorted were treated with execrable cruelty holwell unable to walk was carried before the tyrant who reproached him threatened him and sent him up the country in irons together with some other gentlemen who were suspected of knowing more than they chose to tell about the treasures of the company these persons still bowed down by the sufferings of that great agony were lodged in miserable sheds and fed only with grain and water till at length the intercessions of the female relations of the nabob procured their release one englishwoman had survived that night she was placed in the harem of the prince at murshidabad 
Sir Roger Dowla, in the meantime, sent letters to his nominal sovereign at Delhi, describing the late conquest in the most pompous language. He placed a garrison in Fort William, forbade Englishmen to dwell in the neighbourhood, and directed that in memory of his great actions, Calcutta should thenceforward be called Alinagor, that is to say, the Port of God. In August, the news of the fall of Calcutta reached Madras, and excited the fiercest and bitterest resentment. The cry of the whole settlement was for vengeance. Within forty-eight hours after the arrival of the intelligence, it was determined that an expedition should be sent to the Hooghly, and that Clive should be at the head of the land forces. The naval armament was under the command of Admiral Watson. Nine hundred English infantry, fine troops and full of spirit, and fifteen hundred sepoys composed the army which sailed to punish a prince who had more subjects than Louis the Fifteenth or the Empress Maria Theresa. In October the expedition sailed, but it had to make its way against the adverse winds and did not reach Bengal till December. The Nabob was reveling in fancied security at Morshedabad. He was so profoundly ignorant of the state of foreign countries that he often used to say that there were not ten thousand men in all Europe, and it had never occurred to him as possible that the English would dare to invade his dominions. But though undisturbed by any fear of their military power, he began to miss them greatly, his revenues fell off, and his ministers succeeded in making him understand that a ruler may sometimes find it more profitable to protect traders in the open enjoyment of their gains than to put them to the torture for the purpose of discovering hidden chests of gold and jewels. He was already disposed to permit the company to resume its mercantile operations in his country when he received the news that an English armament was in the Hooghly. He instantly ordered all his troops to assemble at Morshedabad and march towards Calcutta. Clive had commenced operations with his usual vigour. He took Budj Budj, routed the garrison of Fort William, recovered Calcutta, stormed and sacked Hooghly. The Nabob, already disposed to make some concessions to the English, was confirmed in his pacific disposition by these proofs of their power and spirit. He accordingly made overtures to the chiefs of the invading armament, and offered to restore the factory, and to give compensation to those whom he had despoiled. Clive's profession was war, and he felt that there was something discreditable in an accommodation with Sirajah Dowla. But his power was limited. A committee, chiefly composed of servants of the company who had fled from Calcutta, had the principal direction of affairs and these persons were eager to be restored to their posts and compensated for their losses. The government of Madras, apprised that war had commenced in Europe and apprehensive of an attack from the French, became impatient for the return of the armament. The promises of the Nabob were large, the chances of a contest doubtful, and Clive consented to treat, though he expressed his regret that things should not be concluded in so glorious a manner as he could have wished. With this negotiation commences a new chapter in the life of Clive. Hitherto he had been merely a soldier carrying into effect, with eminent ability and valour, the plans of others. Henceforth he is to be chiefly regarded as a statesman, and his military movements are to be considered as subordinate to his political designs. That in his new capacity he displayed great ability and obtained great success is unquestionable but it is also unquestionable that the transactions in which he now began to take a part have left a stain on his moral character. We can by no means agree with Sir John Malcolm, who is obstinately resolved to see nothing but honour integrity in the conduct of his hero. But we can as little agree with Mr. Mill, who has gone so far as to say that Clive was a man to whom deception when it suited his purpose never cost a pang. Clive seems to us to have been constitutionally the very opposite of a knave, bold even to temerity, sincere even to indiscretion, hearty in friendship, open in enmity. Neither in his private life nor in those parts of his public life in which he had to do with his countrymen do we find any signs of a propensity to cunning. On the contrary, 
in all the disputes in which he was engaged as an Englishman against Englishmen, from his boxing matches at school to those stormy altercations at the India House and in Parliament amidst which his later years were passed, his very faults were those of a high and magnanimous spirit. The truth seems to have been that he considered Oriental politics as a game in which nothing was unfair. He knew that the standard of morality among the natives of India differed widely from that established in England. He knew that he had to deal with men destitute of what in Europe is called honour, with men who would give any promise without hesitation and break any promise without shame, with men who would unscrupulously employ corruption, perjury, forgery to compass their ends. His letters show that the great difference between Asiatic and European morality was constantly in his thoughts. He seems to have imagined, most erroneously in our opinion, that he could effect nothing against such adversaries if he was content to be bound by ties from which they were free, if he went on telling truth and hearing none, if he fulfilled to his own hurt all his engagements with confederates who never kept an engagement that was not to their advantage. Accordingly, this man, in the other parts of his life, an honourable English gentleman and a soldier, was no sooner matched against an Indian intriguer than he became himself an Indian intriguer, and descended without scruple to falsehood, to hypocritical caresses, to the substitution of documents, and to the counterfeiting of hands. The negotiations between the English and the Nabob were carried on chiefly by two agents, Mr. Watts, a servant of the company, and a Bengali of the name of Omichund. This Omichund had been one of the wealthiest native merchants resident at Calcutta, and had sustained great losses in consequence of the Nabob's expedition against that place. In the course of his commercial transactions, he had seen much of the English, and was peculiarly qualified to serve as a medium of communication between them and a native court. He possessed great influence with his own race, and had in large measure the Hindu talents, quick observation, tact, dexterity, perseverance, and the Hindu vices, servility, greediness, and treachery. The Nabob behaved with all the faithlessness of an Indian statesman, and with all the levity of a boy whose mind had been enfeebled by power and self-indulgence. He promised, retracted, hesitated, evaded. At one time he advanced with his army in a threatening manner towards Calcutta, but when he saw the resolute front which the English presented, he fell back in alarm and consented to make peace with them on their own terms. The treaty was no sooner concluded than he formed new designs against them. He intrigued with the French authorities at Chandernagore. He invited Bussy to march from the Deccan to the Hooghly and to drive the English out of Bengal. All this was well known to Clive and Watson. They determined accordingly to strike a decisive blow and to attack Chandernagore before the force there could be strengthened by new arrivals, either from the south of India or from Europe. Watson directed the expedition by water, Clive by land. The success of the combined movements was rapid and complete. The fort, the garrison, the artillery, the military stores all fell into the hands of the English. Nearly five hundred European troops were among the prisoners. The Nabob had feared and hated the English even while he was still able to oppose to them their French rivals. The French were now vanquished, and he began to regard the English with still greater fear and still greater hatred. His weak and unprincipled mind oscillated between servility and insolence. One day he sent a large sum to Calcutta as part of the compensation due for the wrongs which he had committed. The next day he sent a present of jewels to Bussy, exhorting that distinguished officer to hasten to protect Bengal against Clive the daring in war on whom, says his highness, may all bad fortune attend. He ordered his army to march against the English. He countermanded his orders. He tore Clive's letters. He then sent answers in the most florid language of compliment. He ordered Watts out of his presence and threatened to impale him. He again sent for Watts and begged pardon for the insult. In the meantime, his wretched maladministration, 
his folly his dissolute manners and his love of the lowest company had disgusted all classes of his subjects soldiers traders civil functionaries the proud and ostentatious mohammedans the timid supple and parsimonious hindus a formidable confederacy was formed against him in which were included Roydelob, the minister of finance mir jaffier the principal commander of the troops and jugat said the richest banker in india the plot was confided to the english agents and a communication was opened between the malcontents at morshedabad and the committee at calcutta in the committee there was much hesitation but clive's voice was given in favour of the conspirators and his vigour and firmness bore down all opposition it was determined that the english should lend their powerful assistance to depose Suraja Dowla and to place Mir Jaffier on the throne of Bengal. In return, Mir Jaffier promised ample compensation to the company and its servants, and a liberal donative to the army, the navy, and the committee. The odious vices of Suraja Dowla, the wrongs which the English had suffered at his hands, the dangers to which our trade must have been exposed had he continued to reign, appear to us fully to justify the resolution of deposing him but nothing can justify the dissimulation which clive stooped to practice he wrote to suraja dowla in terms so affectionate that they for a time lulled that weak prince into perfect security the same courier who carried this soothing letter as clive calls it to the nabob carried to mr watts a letter in the following terms tell mir jaffier to fear nothing i will join him with five thousand men who never turned their backs assure him i will march night and day to his assistance and stand by him as long as i have a man left it was impossible that a plot which had so many ramifications should long remain entirely concealed enough reached the ear of the nabob to arouse his suspicions but he was soon quieted by the fictions and artifices which the inventive genius of omichun produced with miraculous readiness all was going well the plot was nearly ripe when clive learned that omichun was likely to play false the artful bengali had been promised a liberal compensation for all that he had lost at calcutta but this would not satisfy him his services had been great he held the thread of the whole intrigue by one word breathed in the ear of Suraja Dowla, he could undo all that he had done. The lives of Watts, of Mir Jaffier, of all the conspirators were at his mercy, and he determined to take advantage of his situation and to make his own terms. He demanded three hundred thousand pounds sterling as the price of his secrecy and of his assistance. The committee, incensed by the treachery and appalled by the danger, knew not what course to take. But Clive was more than Omichun's match in Omichun's own arts. The man, he said, was a villain. Any artifice which would defeat such knavery was justifiable. The best course would be to promise what was asked. Omichun would soon be at their mercy, and then they might punish him by withholding from him not only the bribe which he now demanded, but also the compensation which all the other sufferers of Calcutta were to receive. His advice was taken, but how was the wary and sagacious Hindu to be deceived? He had demanded that an article touching his claims should be inserted in the treaty between Mir Jaffier and the English, and he would not be satisfied unless he saw it with his own eyes. Clive had an expedient ready. Two treaties were drawn up, one on white paper, the other on red, the former real, the latter fictitious. In the former, Omichun's name was not mentioned. The latter, which was to be shown to him, contained a stipulation in his favour. But another difficulty arose. Admiral Watson had scruples about signing the Red Treaty. Omichun's vigilance and acuteness were such that the absence of so important a name would probably awaken his suspicions. But Clive was not a man to do anything by halves. We almost blushed to write it. He forged Admiral Watson's name. End of chapter 3
Lord Clive by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But another difficulty arose. Admiral Watson had scruples about signing the Red Treaty. Omichon's vigilance and acuteness were such that the absence of so important a name would probably awaken his suspicions. But Clive was not a man to do anything by halves. We almost blushed to write it. He forged Admiral Watson's name. All was now ready for action. Mr. Watts fled secretly from Morshedabad. Clive put his troops in motion and wrote to the Nabob in a tone very different from that of his previous letters. He set forth all the wrongs which the British had suffered, offered to submit the points in dispute to the arbitration of Mir Jaffir, and concluded by announcing that as the rains were about to set in, he and his men would do themselves the honour of waiting on His Highness for an answer. Suraja Dowla instantly assembled his whole force and marched to encounter the English. It had been agreed that Mir Jaffir should separate himself from the Nabob and carry over his division to Clive. But as the decisive moment approached, the fears of the conspirator overpowered his ambition. Clive had advanced to Kosimbuzar. The Nabob lay with a mighty power a few miles off at Plassey, and still Mir Jaffir delayed to fulfil his engagements and returned evasive answers to the earnest remonstrances of the English general. Clive was in a painfully anxious situation. He could place no confidence in the sincerity or in the courage of his confederate, and whatever confidence he might place in his own military talents, and in the valour and discipline of his troops, it was no light thing to engage an army twenty times numerous as his own. Before him lay a river over which it was easy to advance, but over which, if things went ill, not one of his little band would ever return. On this occasion, for the first and for the last time, his dauntless spirit had during a few hours shrank from the fearful responsibility of making a decision. He called a council of war. The majority pronounced against the fighting, and Clive declared his concurrence with the majority. Long afterwards he said that he had never called but one council of war, and that if he had taken the advice of that council, the British would never have been the masters of Bengal. But scarcely had the meeting broken up when he was himself again. He retired alone under the shade of some trees, and passed near an hour there in thought. He came back, determined to put everything to the hazard, and gave orders that all should be in readiness for passing the river on the morrow. The river was passed and at the close of a toilsome day's march the army, long after sunset, took up its quarters in a grove of mango trees near Plassey, within a mile of the enemy. Clive was unable to sleep. He heard through the whole night the sound of drums and cymbals from the vast camp of the Nabob. It is not strange that even his stout heart should now and then have sunk when he reflected against what odds and for what a prize he was in a few hours to contend. Nor was the rest of Suraja Dowla more peaceful. His mind, at once weak and stormy, was distracted by wild and horrible apprehensions. Appalled by the greatness and nearness of the crisis, distrusting his captains, dreading every one who approached him, dreading to be left alone, he sat gloomily in his tent, haunted, a Greek poet would have said, by the furies of those who had cursed him with their last breath in the black hole. The day broke, the day which was to decide the fate of India. At sunrise the army of the Nabob, pouring through many openings of the camp, began to move towards the grove where the English lay. Forty thousand infantry, armed with firelocks, pikes, swords, bows and arrows, covered the plain. They were accompanied by fifty pieces of ordnance of the largest size, each tugged by a long team of white oxen, and each pushed on from behind by an elephant. Some smaller guns, under the direction of a few French auxiliaries, were perhaps more formidable. The cavalry were fifteen thousand, drawn not from the effeminate population of Bengal, but from the bolder race which inhabits the northern provinces, and the practised eye of Clive could perceive that both the men and the horses were more powerful than those of the Carnatic. The force which he had to oppose to this great multitude consisted of only three thousand men, but of these nearly a thousand were English, 
and all were led by English officers and trained in the English discipline. Conspicuous in the ranks of the little army were the men of the 39th Regiment, which still bears on its colours, amidst many honourable additions, one under Wellington in Spain and Gascony, the name of Plassey, and the proud motto, Primus in Indies. The battle commenced with a cannonade, in which the artillery of the nabob did scarcely any execution, while the few field pieces of the English produced great effect. Several of the most distinguished officers in Suraja Dowla's service fell. Disorder began to spread through his ranks. His own terror increased every moment. One of the conspirators urged on him the expediency of retreating. The insidious advice, agreeing as it did with what his own terrors suggested, was readily received. He ordered his army to fall back, and this order decided his fate. Clive snatched the moment and ordered his troops to advance. The confused and dispirited multitude gave way before the onset of disciplined valour. No mob attacked by regular soldiers was ever more completely routed. The little band of Frenchmen, who alone ventured to confront the English, were swept down the stream of fugitives. In an hour the forces of Suraja Dowla were dispersed, never to reassemble. Only five hundred of the vanquished were slain, but their camp, their guns, their baggage, innumerable wagons, innumerable cattle, remained in the power of the conquerors. With the loss of twenty-two soldiers killed and fifty wounded, Clive had scattered an army of near sixty thousand men, and subdued an empire larger and more populous than Great Britain. Mir Jaffier had given no assistance to the English during the action, but as soon as he saw that the fate of the day was decided, he drew off his division of the army, and when the battle was over, sent his congratulations to his ally. The next morning he repaired to the English quarters, not a little uneasy as to the reception which awaited him there. He gave evident signs of alarm when a guard was drawn out to receive him with the honours due his rank, but his apprehensions were speedily removed. Clive came forward to meet him, embraced him, saluted him as nabob of the three great provinces of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, listened graciously to his apologies, and advised him to march without delay to Murshidabad. Suraja Dowla had fled from the field of battle with all the speed with which a fleet camel could carry him, and arrived at Murshidabad in little more than twenty-four hours. There he called his counsellors round him. The wisest advised him to put himself in the hands of the English, from whom he had nothing worse to fear than deposition and confinement. But he attributed this suggestion to treachery. Others urged him to try the chance of war again. He approved the advice and issued orders accordingly. But he wanted spirit to adhere even during one day to a manly resolution. He learned that Mir Jaffir had arrived and his terrors became insupportable. Disguised in a mean dress, with a casket of jewels in his hand, he let himself down at night from a window of his palace, and, accompanied by only two attendants, embarked on the river for Patna. In a few days, Clive arrived at Morshidabad, escorted by two hundred English soldiers and three hundred sepoys, for his residence had been assigned a palace which was surrounded by a garden so spacious that all the troops who accompanied him could conveniently encamp within it. The ceremony of the installation of Mir Jafar was instantly performed. Clive led the new nabob to the seat of honour, placed him on it, presented to him, after the immemorial fashion of the East, an offering of gold, and then, turning to the natives who filled the hall, congratulated them on the good fortune which had freed them from a tyrant. He was compelled on this occasion to use the services of an interpreter, for it is remarkable that long as he resided in India, intimately acquainted as he was with Indian politics and with the Indian character, and adored as he was by his Indian soldiery, he never learned to express himself with facility in any Indian language. He is said, indeed, to have been sometimes under the necessity of employing in his intercourse with natives of India the smattering of Portuguese which he had acquired when a lad in Brazil. The new sovereign was now called upon to fulfil the engagements into which he had entered with his allies. 
A conference was held at the house of Jugat Said, the great banker, for the purpose of making the necessary arrangements. Omichun came thither, fully believing himself to stand high in the favour of Clyde, who, with dissimulation surpassing even the dissimulation of Bengal, had up to that day treated him with undiminished kindness. The white treaty was produced and read. Clive then turned to Mr. Scrafton, one of the servants of the company, and said in English, It is now time to undeceive Omichund. Omichund, said Mr. Scrafton in Hindustani, the red treaty is a trick, you are to have nothing. Omichund fell back insensible into the arms of his attendants. He revived, but his mind was irreparably ruined. Clive, who, though little troubled by scruples of conscience in his dealings with Indian politicians, was not inhuman, seems to have been touched. He saw Omichund a few days later spoke to him kindly, advising him to make a pilgrimage to one of the great temples of India, in the hope that change of scene might restore his health, and was even disposed, notwithstanding all that had passed, again to employ him in the public service. But from the moment of that sudden shock, the unhappy man sank gradually into idiocy. He who had formerly been distinguished by the strength of his understanding and the simplicity of his habits, now squandered the remains of his fortune on childish trinkets, and loved to exhibit himself dressed in rich garments and hung with precious stones. In this abject state he languished a few months and then died. We should not think it necessary to offer any remarks for the purpose of directing the judgment of our readers with respect to this transaction, had not Sir John Malcolm undertaken to defend it in all its parts. He regrets, indeed, that it was necessary to employ means so liable to abuse as a forgery, but he will not admit that any blame attaches to those who deceived the deceiver. He thinks that the English were not bound to keep faith with one who kept no faith with them, and that if they had fulfilled their engagements with the wily Bengali, so signal an example of successful treason would have produced a crowd of imitators. Now, we will not discuss this point on any rigid principles of morality. Indeed, it is quite unnecessary to do so, for looking at the question as a question of expediency, in the lowest sense of the word, and using no arguments but such as Machiavelli might have employed in his conferences with Borgia, we are convinced that Clive was altogether in the wrong, and that he committed not merely a crime, but a blunder. That honesty is the best policy is a maxim which we firmly believe to be generally correct, even with respect to the temporal interest of individuals. But with respect to societies, the rule is subject to still fewer exceptions, and for this reason that the life of societies is longer than the life of individuals. It is possible to mention men who have owed great worldly prosperity to breaches of private faith, but we doubt whether it be possible to mention a state which has on the whole been a gainer by a breach of public faith. The entire history of British India is an illustration of the great truth that it is not prudent to oppose perfidy to perfidy, and that the most efficient weapon with which men can encounter falsehood is truth. During a long course of years, the English rulers of India, surrounded by allies and enemies whom no engagement could bind, have generally acted with sincerity and uprightness and the event has proved that sincerity and uprightness are wisdom. English valour and English intelligence have done less to extend and to preserve our Oriental Empire than English veracity. All that we could have gained from imitating the doublings, the evasions, the fictions, the perjuries which have been employed against us, is as nothing when compared with that we have gained by being the one power in India on whose word reliance can be placed. No oath which superstition can devise, no hostage, however precious, inspires a hundredth part of the confidence which is produced by the yea, yea, and nay, nay of a British envoy. No fastness, however strong by art or nature, gives to its inmates a security like that enjoyed by the chief who, passing through the territories of powerful and deadly enemies, is armed with the British guarantee. 
the mightiest princes of the east can scarcely by the offer of enormous usury draw forth any portion of the wealth which is concealed under the hearths of their subjects the british government offers little more than four per cent and avarice hastens to bring forth tens of millions of rupees from its most secret repositories a hostile monarch may promise mountains of gold to our sepoys on condition that they will desert the standard of the company the company promises only a moderate pension after a long service but every sepoy knows that the promise of the company will be kept he knows that if he lives a hundred years his rice and salt are as secure as the salary of the governor-general and he knows that there is not another state in india which would not in spite of the most solemn vows leave him to die of hunger in a ditch as soon as he had ceased to be useful the greatest advantage which government can possess is to be the one trustworthy government in the midst of governments which nobody can trust this advantage we enjoy in asia had we acted during the last two generations on the principles which sir john malcolm appears to have considered as sound had we as often as we had to deal with people like omichand retaliated by lying and forging and breaking faith after their fashion it is our firm belief that no courage or capacity could have upheld our empire sir john malcolm admits that clive's breach of faith could be justified only by the strongest necessity as we think that breach of faith not only unnecessary but most inexpedient we need hardly say that we altogether condemn it omichund was not the only victim of the revolution Suraja Dowla was taken in a few days after his flight and was brought before Mir Jafir. There he flung himself on the ground in convulsions of fear and with tears and loud cries implored the mercy which he had never shown. Mir Jafir hesitated, but his son Miram, a youth of seventeen, who in feebleness of brain and savageness of nature greatly resembled the wretched captive, was implacable surajah dowlah was led into a secret chamber to which in a short time the minister of death was sent in this act the english bore no part and mir jaffier understood so much of their feelings that he thought it necessary to apologize to them for having avenged them on their most malignant enemy the shower of wealth now fell copiously on the company and its servants a sum of eight hundred thousand pounds sterling in coined silver was sent down the river from Morshedabad to fort william the fleet which conveyed this treasure consisted of more than a hundred boats and performed its triumphal voyage with flags flying and music playing calcutta which a few months before had been desolate was now more prosperous than ever trade revived and the signs of affluence appeared in every english house as to clive there was no limit to his acquisitions but his own moderation the treasury of bengal was thrown open to him there were piled up after the usage of indian princes immense masses of coin among which might not seldom be detected the florins and byzants with which before any european ship had turned the cape of good hope the venetians purchased the stuffs and spices of the east clive walked between heaps of gold and silver crowned with rubies and diamonds and was at liberty to help himself he accepted between two and three hundred thousand pounds the pecuniary transactions between mir jaffier and clive were sixteen years later condemned by the public voice and severely criticised in parliament they are vehemently defended by sir john malcolm the accusers of the victorious general represented his gains as the wages of corruption or as plunder extorted at the point of the sword from a helpless ally the biographer on the other hand considers these great acquisitions as free gifts honourable alike to the donor and to the receiver and compares them to the rewards bestowed by foreign powers on marlborough on nelson and on wellington it had always he said been customary in the east to give and receive presents and there was as yet no act of parliament positively prohibiting english functionaries in india from profiting by this asiatic usage 
This reasoning, we own, does not quite satisfy us. We do not suspect Clive of selling the interests of his employers or his country, but we cannot acquit him of having done what, if not in itself evil, was yet of evil example. Nothing is more clear than that a general ought to be the servant of his own government and of no other. It follows that whatever rewards he receives for his services ought to be given either by his own government or with the full knowledge and approbation of his own government. This rule ought to be strictly maintained even with respect to the merest bauble, with respect to a cross, a medal, or a yard of coloured ribbon. But how can any government be well served if those who command its forces are at liberty, without its permission, without its privity, to accept princely fortunes from its allies? It is idle to say that there was then no act of Parliament prohibiting the practice of taking presents from Asiatic sovereigns. It is not on the act which was passed at a later period for the purpose of preventing any such taking of presents, but on grounds which were valid before that act was passed, on grounds of common law and common sense that we arraign the conduct of Clive. There is no act that we know of prohibiting the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs from being in the pay of continental powers, but it is not the less true that a Secretary who should receive a secret pension from France would grossly violate his duty and would deserve severe punishment. Sir John Malcolm compares the conduct of Clive with that of the Duke of Wellington. Suppose, and we beg pardon for putting such a supposition even for the sake of argument, that the Duke of Wellington had, after the campaign of 1815, and while he commanded the army of occupation in France, privately accepted two hundred thousand pounds from Louis the Eighteenth as a mark of gratitude for the great services which his grace had rendered the house of bourbon what would be thought of such a transaction yet the statute book no more forbids the taking of presents in europe now than it forbade the taking of presents in asia then at the same time it must be admitted that in clive's case there were many extenuating circumstances he considered himself as the general not of the crown but of the company the company had by implication at least authorized its agents to enrich themselves by means of the liberality of the native princes, and by other means still more objectionable. It was hardly to be expected that the servant should entertain strict notions of his duty that were entertained by his masters. Though Clive did not distinctly acquaint his employers with what had taken place and request their sanction, he did not, on the other hand, by studied concealment, show that he was conscious of having done wrong. On the contrary, he avowed with the greatest openness that the nabob's bounty had raised him to affluence. Lastly, though we think that he ought not in such a way to have taken anything, we must admit that he deserves praise for having taken so little. He accepted twenty lakhs of rupees. It would have cost him only a word to make the twenty forty. It was a very easy exercise of virtue to declaim in England against Clive's rapacity, but not one in a hundred of his accusers would have shown so much self-command in the treasury of Morshedabad. Mir Jafir could be upheld on the throne only by the hand which had placed him on it. He was not indeed a mere boy, nor had he been so unfortunate as to be born in the purple. He was not therefore quite so imbecile or quite so depraved as his predecessor had been, but he had none of the talents or virtues which his post required, and his son and heir, Miran, was another Suraja Daula. The recent revolution had unsettled the minds of men. Many chiefs were in open insurrection against the new nabob. The viceroy of the rich and powerful province of Oude, which, like the other viceroys of the Mogul, was now in truth an independent sovereign, menaced Bengal with invasion. Nothing but the talents and authority of Clive could support the tottering government. While things were in this state, a ship arrived with dispatches which had been written at the India House before the news of the Battle of Plassey had reached London. The directors had determined to place the English settlements in Bengal under a government constituted in the most cumbrous and absurd manner. 
and to make the matters worse, no place in the arrangement was assigned to Clive. The persons who were selected to form this new government, greatly to their honour, took on themselves the responsibility of disobeying these preposterous orders, and invited Clive to exercise the supreme authority. He consented, and it soon appeared that the servants of the company had only anticipated the wishes of their employers. The directors, on receiving news of Clive's brilliant success, instantly appointed him governor of their possessions in Bengal, with the highest marks of gratitude and esteem. His power was now boundless and far surpassed even that which Dupleix had attained in the south of India. Mir Jaffier regarded him with slavish awe. On one occasion the nabob spoke with severity to a native chief of high rank, whose followers had been engaged in a brawl with some of the company's sepoys. "'Are you yet to learn,' he said, "'who that Colonel Clive is, and in what station God has placed him?' The chief, who was a famous jester, and an old friend of Mir Jaffier, could venture to take liberties, answered, "'I affront the Colonel, I who never get up in the morning without making three low bows to his jackass?' This was hardly an exaggeration. Europeans and natives were alike at Clive's feet. The English regarded him as the only man who could force Mir Jaffier to keep his engagements with them. Mir Jaffier regarded him as the only man who could protect the new dynasty against turbulent subjects and encroaching neighbors. It is but justice to say that Clive used his power ably and vigorously for the advantage of his country. He sent forth an expedition against the tract lying to the north of the Carnatic. In this tract the French still had the ascendancy, and it was important to dislodge them. The conduct of the enterprise was entrusted to an officer of the name of Ford, who was then little known, but in whom the keen eye of the governor had detected military talents of a high order. The success of the expedition was rapid and splendid. While a considerable part of the army of Bengal was thus engaged at a distance, a new and formidable danger menaced the western frontier. The great Mogul was a prisoner at Delhi in the hands of a subject. His eldest son, named Shah Alum, destined to be, during many years, the sport of adverse fortune, and to be a tool in the hands, first of the Marathas, and then of the English, had fled from the palace of his father. His birth was still revered in India. Some powerful princes, the Nabob of Oud in particular, were inclined to favour him. Shah Alum found it easy to draw to his standard great numbers of the military adventurers with whom every part of the country swarmed. An army of forty thousand men of various races and religions, Marathas, Rohillas, Jouts, and Afghans, were speedily assembled round him, and he formed the design of overthrowing the upstart whom the English had elevated to a throne, and of establishing his own authority throughout Bengal, Orissa, and Bihar. Mir Jaffier's terror was extreme, and the only expedient which occurred to him was to purchase by the payment of a large sum of money an accommodation with Shah Alum. This expedient had been repeatedly employed by those who, before him, had ruled the rich and unwarlike provinces near the mouth of the Ganges. But Clive treated the suggestion with a scorn worthy of his strong sense and dauntless courage. If you do this, he wrote, you will have the Nabob of Oud, the Marathas, and many more come from all parts of the confines of your country, who will bull you out of money until you have none left in your treasury. I beg your excellency will rely on the fidelity of the English and of those troops who are attached to you. He wrote in a similar strain to the governor of Patna, a brave native soldier whom he highly esteemed. Come to no terms, defend your city to the last, rest assured that the English are staunch and firm friends, and that they never desert a cause in which they have once taken a part. He kept his word. Shah Alum had invested Patna, and was on the point of proceeding to storm when he learned that the colonel was advancing by forced marches. The whole army which was approaching consisted of only 450 Europeans and 2,500 sepoys. But Clive and his Englishmen were now objects of dread over all the east. As soon as his advance guard appeared, the besiegers fled before him. 
a few french adventurers who were about the person of the prince advised him to try the chance of battle but in vain in a few days this great army which had been regarded with so much uneasiness by the court of murshidabad melted away before the mere terror of the british alone the conqueror returned in triumph to fort william the joy of mir jaffier was as unbounded as his fears had been and led him to bestow on his preserver a princely token of gratitude the quit-rent which the east india company were bound to pay to the nabob for the extensive lands held by them to the south of calcutta amounted to near thirty thousand pounds sterling a year the whole of this splendid estate sufficient to support with dignity the highest rank of the british peerage was now conferred on clive for life this present we think clive justified in accepting it was a present which from its very nature could be no secret in fact the company itself was his tenant and by its acquiescence signified its approbation of mir jaffier's grant but the gratitude of mir jaffier did not last long he had for some time felt that the powerful ally who had set him up might pull him down and had been looking round for support against the formidable strength by which he had himself been hitherto supported he knew that it would be impossible to find among the natives of india any force which would look the colonel's little army in the face the french power in bengal was extinct but the fame of the dutch had anciently been great in the eastern seas and it was not yet distinctly known in asia how much the power of holland had declined in europe secret communications passed between the court of morshidabad and the dutch factory in jinshura and urgent letters were sent from Chinsura, exhorting the government of Batavia to fit out an expedition which might balance the power of the English in Bengal. The authorities of Batavia, eager to extend the influence of their country, and still more eager to obtain for themselves a share of the wealth which had recently raised so many English adventurers to opulence, equipped a powerful armament seven large ships from java arrived unexpectedly in the hooghly the military force on board amounted to fifteen hundred men of whom about one half were europeans the enterprise was well timed clive had sent such large detachments to oppose the french in the carnatic that his army was now inferior in number to that of the dutch he knew that mir jaffier secretly favoured the invaders he knew that he took on himself a serious responsibility if he attacked the forces of a friendly power, that the English ministers could not wish to see a war with Holland added to that in which they were already engaged with France, that they might disavow his acts, that they might punish him. He had recently remitted a great part of his fortune to Europe through the Dutch East India Company, and he had therefore a strong interest in avoiding any quarrel but he was satisfied that if he suffered the batavian armament to pass up the river and to join the garrison of chinsura mir jaffier would throw himself into the arms of these new allies and that the english ascendancy in bengal would be exposed to most serious danger he took his resolution with characteristic boldness and was most ably seconded by his officers particularly by colonel ford to whom the most important part of the operations was entrusted the dutch attempted to force a passage the english encountered them both by land and water on both elements the enemy had a great superiority of force on both they were signally defeated their ships were taken their troops were put to a total rout almost all the european soldiers who had constituted the main strength of the invading army were killed or taken the conquerors sat down before chinsura and the chiefs of that settlement now thoroughly humbled consented to the terms which clive dictated they engaged to build no fortifications and to raise no troops beyond a small force necessary for the police of their factories and it was distinctly provided that any violation of these covenants should be punished with instant expulsion from bengal end of chapter four of lord clive by thomas babington macaulay this librivox recording is in the public domain
Three months after this great victory, Clive sailed for England. At home, honours and rewards awaited him, not indeed equal to his claims or to his ambition, but still such as, when his age, his rank in the army, and his original place in society are considered, must be pronounced rare and splendid. He was raised to the Irish peerage, and encouraged to expect an English title. George the Third, who had just ascended the throne, received him with great distinction. The ministers paid him marked attention, and Pitt, whose influence in the House of Commons and in the country was unbounded, was eager to mark his regard for one whose exploits had contributed so much to the lustre of that memorable period. The great orator had already in Parliament described Clive as a heaven-born general, as a man who, bred to the labour of the desk, had displayed a military genius which might excite the admiration of the King of Prussia. There were then no reporters in the gallery, but these words, emphatically spoken by the first statesman of the age, had passed from mouth to mouth, had been transmitted to Clive in Bengal, and had greatly delighted and flattered him. Indeed, since the death of Wolfe, Clive was the only English general of whom his countrymen had much reason to be proud. The Duke of Cumberland had been generally unfortunate, and his single victory, having been gained over his countrymen and used with merciless severity, had been more fatal to his popularity than his many defeats. Conway, versed in the learning of his profession, and personally courageous, wanted vigour and capacity. Granby, honest, generous, and brave as a lion, had neither science nor genius. Sackville, inferior in knowledge and abilities to none of his contemporaries, had incurred, unjustly as we believe, the imputation most fatal to the character of a soldier. It was under the command of a foreign general that the British had triumphed at Minden and Warburg. The people, therefore, as was natural, greeted with pride and delight a captain of their own, whose native courage and self-taught skill placed him on a level with the great tacticians of Germany. The wealth of Clive was such as enabled him to vie with the first grandees of England. There remains proof that he had remitted more than a hundred and eighty thousand pounds through the Dutch East India Company, and more than forty thousand pounds through the English Company. The amount which he had sent home through private houses was also considerable. He had invested great sums in jewels, then a very common mode of remittance from India. His purchase of diamonds at Madras alone amounted to twenty-five thousand pounds. Besides a great mass of ready money, he had his Indian estate, valued by himself at twenty-seven thousand a year. His whole annual income, in the opinion of Sir John Malcolm, who was desirous to state it as low as possible, exceeded forty thousand pounds, and incomes of forty thousand pounds at the time of the accession of George the Third were at least as rare as incomes of a hundred thousand pounds now. We may safely affirm that no Englishman who had started with nothing has ever, in any line of life, created such a fortune at the early age of thirty-four. It would be unjust not to add that Clive made a creditable use of his riches. As soon as the Battle of Plassey had laid the foundation of his fortune, he sent ten thousand pounds to his sisters, bestowed as much more on other poor friends and relations, ordered his agent to pay eight hundred a year to his parents, and to insist that they should keep a carriage, and settled five hundred a year on his old commander Lawrence, whose means were very slender. The whole sum which Clive expended in this manner may be calculated at fifty thousand pounds. He now set himself to cultivate parliamentary interest. His purchases of land seem to have been made in great measure with that view, and after the general election of 1761 he found himself in the House of Commons, at the head of a body of dependents whose support must have been important to any administration. In English politics, however, he did not take a prominent part. His first attachments, as we have seen, were to Mr. Fox. At a later period he was attracted by the genius and success of Mr. Pitt, but finally he connected himself in the closest manner with George Grenville. Early in the session of 1764, when the illegal and impolitic persecution of that worthless demagogue Wilkes had strongly excited the public mind, the town was amused by an anecdote 
which we have seen in some unpublished memoirs of Horace Walpole. Old Mr. Richard Clive, who, since his son's elevation, had been introduced into society for which his former habits had not well fitted him, presented himself at the levee. The king asked him where Lord Clive was. "'He will be in town very soon,' said the old gentleman, loud enough to be heard by the whole circle, "'and then your majesty will have another vote.' But in truth all Clive's views were directed towards the country in which he had so eminently distinguished himself as a soldier and a statesman, and it was by considerations relating to India that his conduct as a public man in England was regulated. The power of the company, though an anomaly, is in our time, we are firmly persuaded, a beneficial anomaly. In the time of Clive it was not merely an anomaly, but a nuisance. There was no board of control. The directors were for the most part mere traders, ignorant of general politics, ignorant of the peculiarities of the empire which had strangely become subject to them. The court of proprietors, wherever it chose to interfere, was able to have its way. That court was more numerous as well as more powerful than at present, for then every share of five hundred pounds conferred a vote. The meetings were large, stormy, even riotous, the debates indecently virulent. All the turbulence of a Westminster election, all the trickery and corruption of a Grampund election, disgraced the proceedings of this assembly on questions of the most solemn importance. Fictitious votes were manufactured on a gigantic scale. Clive himself laid out a hundred thousand pounds in the purchase of stock, which he then divided among nominal proprietors on whom he could depend, and whom he brought down in his train to every discussion and every ballot, others did the same, though not to quite so enormous an extent. The interest taken by the public of England in Indian questions was then far greater than at present, and the reason is obvious. At present a writer enters the service young, he climbs slowly, he is fortunate if at forty-five he can return to his country with an annuity of a thousand a year, and with savings amounting to thirty thousand pounds. A great quantity of wealth is made by English functionaries in India, but no single functionary makes a very large fortune, and what is made is slowly, hardly, and honestly earned. Only four or five high political offices are reserved for public men from England the residencies, the secretaryships, the seats in the boards of revenue and in the Sutter courts, are all filled by men who have given the best years of life to the service of the company, nor can any talents, however splendid, or any connections, however powerful, obtain those lucrative posts for any person who is not entered by the regular door and mounted by the regular gradations. Seventy years ago less money was brought home from the East than in our time, but it was divided among a very much smaller number of persons, and immense sums were often accumulated in a few months. Any Englishman, whatever his age might be, might hope to be one of the lucky emigrants. If he made a good speech in Leadenhall Street, or published a clever pamphlet in defence of the chairman, he might be sent out in the company's service, and might return in three or four years as rich as Pigo or as Clive. Thus the India House was a lottery office, which invited everybody to take a chance, and held out ducal fortunes as the prizes destined for the lucky few. As soon as it was known that there was a part of the world where a lieutenant-colonel had one morning received as a present an estate as large as that of the Earl of Bath or the Marquis of Rockingham, and where it seemed that such a trifle as ten or twenty thousand pounds was to be had by any British functionary for the asking, Society began to exhibit all the symptoms of the South Sea year, a feverish excitement, an ungovernable impatience to be rich, a contempt for slow, sure, and moderate gains. At the head of the preponderating party in the India House had long stood a powerful, able, and ambitious director of the name of Sullivan. He had conceived a strong jealousy of Clive, and remembered with bitterness the audacity with which the late governor of Bengal had repeatedly set at naught the authority of the distant directors of the company. An apparent reconciliation took place after Clive's arrival, but enmity remained deeply rooted in the hearts of both. The whole body of directors was then chosen annually. 
At the election of 1763, Clive attempted to break down the power of the dominant faction. The contest was carried on with a violence which he describes as tremendous. Sullivan was victorious and hastened to take his revenge. The grant of rent which Clive had received from Mir Jaffier was, in the opinion of the best English lawyers, valid. It had been made by exactly the same authority from which the company had received their chief possessions in Bengal, and the company had long acquiesced in it. The directors, however, most unjustly determined to confiscate it, and Clive was forced to file a bill in chancery against them. But a great and sudden turn in affairs was at hand. Every ship from Bengal had for some time brought alarming tidings. The internal misgovernment of the province had reached such a point that it could go no further. What indeed was to be expected from a body of public servants exposed to temptations such that, as Clive once said, flesh and blood could not bear it, armed with irresistible power and responsible only to the corrupt, turbulent, distracted, ill-informed company, situated at such a distance that the average interval between the sending of a dispatch and the receipt of an answer was above a year and a half. Accordingly, during the five years which followed the departure of Clive from Bengal, the misgovernment of the English was carried to a point such as seems hardly compatible with the very existence of society. The Roman proconsul, who, in a year or two, squeezed out of a province the means of rearing marble palaces and baths on the shores of Campania, of drinking from amber, of feasting on singing birds, of exhibiting armies of gladiators and flocks of camel leopards. The Spanish viceroy, who, leaving behind him the curses of Mexico or Lima, entered Madrid with a long train of gilded coaches and of sumpter horses trapped and shod with silver, were now outdone. Cruelty, indeed, properly so called, was not among the vices of the servants of the company. But cruelty itself could hardly have produced greater evils than sprang from their unprincipled eagerness to be rich. They pulled down their creature, Mir Jaffir. They set up in his place another nabob named Mir Kosim. But Mir Kosim had parts in a will, and though sufficiently inclined to oppress his subjects himself, he could not bear to see them ground to dust by the oppressions which yielded him no profit, nay, which destroyed his revenue in the very source. The English accordingly pulled down Mir Qasim and set up Mir Jaffir again, and Mir Qasim, after revenging himself by a massacre surpassing in atrocity that of the Black Hole, fled to the dominions of the Nabob of Oud. At every one of these revolutions, the new prince divided among his foreign masters whatever could be scraped together in the treasury of his fallen predecessor. The immense population of his domains was given up as a prey to those who had made him a sovereign and who could unmake him. The servants of the company obtained, not for their employers, but for themselves, a monopoly of almost the whole internal trade. They forced the natives to buy dear and to sell cheap, they insulted with impunity the tribunals, the police, and the fiscal authorities of the country. They covered with their protection a set of native dependents who ranged through the provinces spreading desolation and terror wherever they appeared. Every servant of a British factor was armed with all the power of his master, and his master was armed with all the power of the company. Enormous fortunes were thus rapidly accumulated at Calcutta, while thirty millions of human beings were reduced to the extremity of wretchedness. They had been accustomed to live under tyranny, but never under tyranny like this. They found the little finger of the company thicker than the loins of Surajah Dowla. Under their old masters they had at least one resource. When the evil became insupportable, the people rose and pulled down the government. But the English government was not to be so shaken off. That government, oppressive as the most oppressive form of barbarian despotism, was strong with all the strength of civilization. It resembled the government of evil genii, rather than the government of human tyrants. Even despair could not inspire the soft Bengali with courage to confront men of English breed, the hereditary nobility of mankind, whose skill and valor had so often triumphed in spite of tenfold odds. The unhappy race never attempted resistance. 
Sometimes they submitted in patient misery. Sometimes they fled from the white man as their fathers had been used to fly from the Mahratta, and the palanquin of the English traveller was often carried through silent villages and towns which the report of his approach had made desolate. The foreign lords of Bengal were naturally object of hatred to all the neighbouring powers, and to all the haughty race presented a dauntless front. The English armies, everywhere outnumbered, were everywhere victorious. A succession of commanders formed in the school of Clive still maintained the fame of their country. It must be acknowledged, says the Mussulman historian of those times, that this nation's presence of mind, firmness of temper, and undaunted bravery are past all question. They join the most resolute courage to the most cautious prudence, nor have they their equals in the art of ranging themselves in battle array and fighting in order. If to so many military qualifications they knew how to join the arts of government, if they exerted as much ingenuity and solicitude in relieving the people of God as they do in whatever concerns their military affairs, no nation in the world would be preferable to them or worthier of command. But the people under their dominion groan everywhere and are reduced to poverty and distress. O oh God, come to the assistance of thine afflicted servants and deliver them from the oppressions which they suffer. It was impossible, however, that even the military establishment should long continue exempt from the vices which pervaded every other part of the government. Rapacity, luxury, and the spirit of insubordination spread from the civil service to the officers of the army, and from the officers to the soldiers. The evil continued to grow till every mess-room became the seat of conspiracy and cabal, until the sepoys could be kept in order only by wholesale executions. At length the state of things in Bengal began to excite uneasiness at home. A succession of revolutions, a disorganized administration, the natives pillaged, yet the company not enriched, every fleet bringing back fortunate adventurers who were able to purchase manors and to build stately dwellings, yet bringing back also alarming accounts of the financial prospects of the government, war on the frontiers, disaffection in the army, the national character disgraced by excesses resembling those of Verres and Pizarro, such was the spectacle which dismayed those who were conversant with Indian affairs. The general cry was that Clive, and Clive alone, could save the empire which he had founded. This feeling manifested itself in the strongest manner at a very full general court of proprietors. Men of all parties, forgetting their feuds and trembling for their dividends, exclaimed that Clive was the man whom the crisis required, that the oppressive proceedings which had been adopted respecting his estate ought to be dropped, and that he ought to be entreated to return to India. Clive rose. As to his estate, he said, he would make such propositions to the directors as would, he trusted, lead to an amicable settlement. But there was a still greater difficulty. It was proper to tell them that he would never undertake the government of Bengal while his enemy Sullivan was chairman of the company. The tumult was violent. Sullivan could scarcely obtain a hearing. An overwhelming majority of the assembly was on Clive's side. Sullivan wished to try the result of a ballot, but according to the bylaws of the company there can be no ballot except on a requisition signed by nine proprietors, and though hundreds were present, nine persons could not be found to set their hands to such a requisition. Clive was, in consequence, nominated Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the British possessions in Bengal. But he adhered to his declaration, and refused to enter on his office till the event of the next election of directors should be known. The contest was obstinate, but Clive triumphed. Sullivan, lately absolute master of the India House, was within a vote of losing his own seat, and both the chairman and the deputy chairman were friends of the new governor. Such were the circumstances under which Lord Clive sailed for the third and last time to India. In May 1765 he reached Calcutta, and he found the whole machine of government even more fearfully disorganized than he had anticipated. Mir Jafir, who had some time before lost his eldest son, Miran, 
had died while clive was on his voyage out the english functionaries at calcutta had already received from home strict orders not to accept presents from the native princes but eager for gain and unaccustomed to respect the commands of their distant ignorant and negligent masters they again set up the throne of bengal to sail about one hundred and forty thousand pounds sterling was distributed among nine of the most powerful servants of the company and in consideration of this bribe an infant son of the deceased nabob was placed on the seat of his father the news of the ignominious bargain met clive on his arrival in a private letter written immediately after his landing to an intimate friend he poured out his feelings in language which proceeding from a man so daring so resolute and so little given to theatrical display of sentiment seems to us singularly touching alas he says how is the english name sunk i could not avoid paying the tribute of a few tears to the departed and lost fame of the british nation irrecoverably so i fear however i do declare by that great being who is the searcher of all hearts and to whom we must be accountable if there be a hereafter that i am come out with a mind superior to all corruption and that i am determined to destroy these great and growing evils or perish in the attempt the council met and clive stated to them his full determination to make a thorough reform and to use for that purpose the whole of the ample authority civil and military which had been confided to him johnston one of the boldest and worst men in the assembly made some show of opposition clive interrupted him and haughtily demanded whether he meant to question the power of the new government johnston was cowed and disclaimed any such intention all the faces round the board grew long and pale and not another syllable of dissent was uttered clive redeemed his pledge he remained in india about a year and a half and in that short time effected one of the most extensive difficult and salutary reforms that ever was accomplished by any statesman this was the part of his life on which he afterwards looked back with most pride he had it in his power to triple his already splendid fortune to connive at abuses while pretending to remove them to conciliate the good will of all the english in bengal by giving up to their rapacity a helpless and timid race who knew not where the island lay which sent forth their oppressors and whose complaints had little chance of being heard across fifteen thousand miles of ocean he knew that if he applied himself in earnest to the work of reformation he should raise every bad passion in arms against him he knew how unscrupulous how implacable would be the hatred of those ravenous adventurers who having counted on accumulating in a few months fortunes sufficient to support peerages should find all their hopes frustrated but he had chosen the good part and he called up all the force of his mind for a battle far harder than that of Plassey. at first success seemed hopeless but soon all obstacles began to bend before that iron courage and that vehement will the receiving of presents from the natives was rigidly prohibited the private trade of the servants of the company was put down the whole settlement seemed to be set as one man against these measures but the inexorable governor declared that if he could not find support at fort william he would procure it elsewhere and sent for some civil servants from madras to assist him in carrying on the administration the most factious of his opponents he turned out of their offices the rest submitted to what was inevitable and in a very short time all resistance was quelled but clive was far too wise a man not to see that the recent abuses were partly to be ascribed to a cause which could not fail to produce similar abuses as soon as the pressure of his strong hand was withdrawn the company had followed a mistaken policy with respect to the remuneration of its servants the salaries were too low to afford even those indulgences which are necessary to the health and comfort of europeans in a tropical climate to lay by a rupee from such scanty pay was impossible 
it could not be supposed that men of even average abilities would consent to pass the best years of life in exile under a burning sun for no other consideration than these stinted wages it had accordingly been understood from a very early period that the company's agents were at liberty to enrich themselves by their private trade this practice had been seriously injurious to the commercial interests of the corporation that very intelligent observer sir thomas roe in the reign of james i strongly urged the directors to apply a remedy to the abuse absolutely prohibit the private trade said he for your business will be better done i know this is harsh men profess they come not for bare wages but you will take away this plea if you give great wages to their content and then you know what you part from in spite of this excellent advice the company adhered to the old system paid low salaries and connived at the indirect gains of the agents the pay of a member of council was only three hundred pounds a year yet it was notorious that such a functionary could not live in india for less than ten times that sum and it could not be expected that he would be content to live even handsomely in india without laying up something against the time of his return to england this system before the conquest of bengal might affect the amount of the dividends payable to the proprietors but could do little harm in any other way but the company was now a ruling body its servants might still be called factors junior merchants senior merchants but they were in truth proconsuls propraetors procurators of extensive regions they had immense power their regular pay was universally admitted to be insufficient they were by the ancient usage of the service and by the implied permission of their employers warranted in enriching themselves by indirect means and this had been the origin of the frightful oppression and corruption which desolated bengal clive saw clearly that it was absurd to give men power and to require them to live in penury he justly concluded that no reform could be effectual which should not be coupled with a plan for liberally remunerating the civil servants of the company the directors he knew were not disposed to sanction any increase of the salaries out of their own treasury the only course which remained open to the governor was one which exposed him to much misrepresentation but which we think him fully justified in adopting he appropriated to the support of the service the monopoly of salt which has formed down to our own time a principal head of indian revenue and he divided the proceeds according to a scale which seems to have been not unreasonably fixed he was in consequence accused by his enemies and has been accused by historians of disobeying his instructions of violating his promises of authorizing that very abuse which it was his special mission to destroy namely the trade of the company's servants but every discerning and impartial judge will admit that there was really nothing in common between the system which he set up and that which he was sent to destroy the monopoly of salt had been a source of revenue to the government of india before clive was born it continued to be so long after his death the civil servants were clearly entitled to a maintenance out of the revenue and all that clive did was to charge a particular portion of the revenue with their maintenance he thus while he put an end to the practices by which gigantic fortunes had been rapidly accumulated gave to every british functionary employed in the east the means of slowly but surely acquiring a competence yet such is the injustice of mankind that none of those acts which are the real stains of his life has drawn on him so much obloquy as this measure which was in truth a reform necessary to the success of all his other reforms he had quelled the opposition of the civil servants that of the army was more formidable some of the retrenchments which had been ordered by the directors affected the interests of the military service and a storm arose such as even caesar would not willingly have faced it was no light thing to encounter the resistance of those who held the power of the sword in a country governed only by the sword two hundred english officers engaged in a conspiracy against the government 
and determined to resign their commissions on the same day not doubting that clive would grant any terms rather than see the army on which alone the british empire in the east rested left without commanders they little knew the unconquerable spirit with which they had to deal clive had still a few officers around his person on whom he could rely he sent to fort st george for a fresh supply he gave commissions even to mercantile agents who were disposed to support him at this crisis and he sent orders that every officer who resigned should be instantly brought up to Calcutta. The conspirators found that they had miscalculated. The governor was inexorable, the troops were steady, the sepoys, over whom Clive had always possessed extraordinary influence, stood by him with unshaken fidelity, the leaders in the plot were arrested, tried, and cashiered, the rest, humbled and dispirited, begged to be permitted to withdraw their resignations. Many of them declared their repentance even with tears. The younger offenders Clive treated with lenity. To the ringleaders he was inflexibly severe, but his severity was pure from all taint of private malevolence. While he sternly upheld the just authority of his office, he passed by personal insults and injuries with magnanimous disdain. One of the conspirators was accused of having planned the assassination of the governor, but Clive would not listen to the charge. The officers, he said, are Englishmen, not assassins. End of chapter 5《คลายบ》ของทอมัสบาบิงตันมาคอลีนี่ลีบาร์บ็อกซ์รายงานอยู่ในพื้นที่ทางการแพทย์ตอนนี้ที่ทำหน้าที่ปกครองราชการและมีอำนาจในการปกครองประเทศอังกฤษเขาเป็นผู้ชนะในการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษเป็นการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษเป็นการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษการทำงานในประเทศอังกฤษ He had been joined by many Afghans and Marathas, and there was no small reason to expect a general coalition of all the native powers against the English. But the name of Clive quelled in an instant all opposition. The enemy implored peace in the humblest language, and submitted to such terms as the new governor chose to dictate. At the same time, the government of Bengal was placed on a new footing. The power of the English in that province had hitherto been altogether undefined. It was unknown to the ancient constitution of the empire, and it had been ascertained by no compact. It resembled the power which, in the last decrepitude of the Western Empire, was exercised over Italy by the great chiefs of foreign mercenaries, the Rikimers and the Odoacers, who put up and pulled down at their pleasure a succession of insignificant princes dignified with the names of caesar and augustus but as in italy so in india the warlike strangers at length found it expedient to give to a domination which had been established by arms the sanction of law and ancient prescription theodoric thought it politic to obtain from the distant court of byzantium a commission appointing him ruler of italy and Clive, in the same manner, applied to the court of Delhi for a formal grant of the powers of which he already possessed the reality. The Mogul was absolutely helpless, and though he murmured, had reason to be well pleased, that if the English were disposed to give solid rupees, which he never could have extorted from them, in exchange for a few Persian characters which cost him nothing. A bargain was speedily struck, and the titular sovereign of Hindustan issued a warrant empowering the company to collect and administer the revenues of Bengal, Orissa, and Bihar. There was still a nabob who stood to the British authorities in the same relation in which the last driveling Chilperics and Childericks of the Merovingian line stood to their able and vigorous mayors of the palace, to Charles Martel, and to Pepin. At one time Clive had almost made up his mind to discard this phantom altogether, but afterwards he thought that it might be convenient still to use the name of the nabob, particularly in dealings with other European nations. The French, the Dutch, and the Danes would, he conceived, submit far more readily to the authority of the native prince, 
whom they had always been accustomed to respect than to that of a rival trading corporation this policy may at that time have been judicious but the pretense was soon found to be too flimsy to impose on anybody and it was altogether laid aside the heir of mir jaffir still resides at murshidabad the ancient capital of his house still bears the title of nabob is still accosted by the english as your highness and is still suffered to retain a portion of the regal state which surrounded his ancestors a pension of a hundred and sixty thousand pounds a year is annually paid to him by the government his carriage is surrounded by guards and preceded by attendants with silver maces his person and his dwelling are exempted from the ordinary authority of the ministers of justice but he has not the smallest share of political power and is in fact only a noble and wealthy subject of the company it would have been easy for clive during his second administration in bengal to accumulate riches such as no subject in europe possessed he might indeed without subjecting the rich inhabitants of the province to any pressure beyond that to which their mildest rulers had accustomed them have received presents to the amount of three hundred thousand pounds a year the neighbouring princes would gladly have paid any price for his favour but he appears to have strictly adhered to the rules which he had laid down for the guidance of others the rajah of benares offered him diamonds of great value the nabob of oud pressed him to accept a large sum of money and a casket of costly jewels clive courteously but peremptorily refused and it should be observed that he made no merit of his refusal and that the facts did not come to light till after his death he kept an exact account of his salary of his share of the profits accruing from the trade in salt and of those presents which according to the fashion of the east it would be churlish to refuse out of the sum arising from these resources he defrayed the expenses of his situation the surplus he divided among a few attached friends who had accompanied him to india he always boasted and as far as we can judge he boasted with truth that this last administration diminished instead of increasing his fortune one large sum indeed he accepted mir jaffier had left him by will above sixty thousand pounds sterling in specie and jewels and the rules which had been recently laid down extended only to presents from the living and did not affect legacies from the dead clive took the money but not for himself he made the whole over to the company in trust for officers and soldiers invalided in their service the fund which still bears his name owes its origin to this princely donation after a stay of eighteen months the state of his health made it necessary for him to return to europe at the close of january seventeen sixty seven he quitted for the last time the country on whose destinies he had exercised so mighty an influence his second return from bengal was not like his first greeted by the acclamations of his countrymen numerous causes were already at work which embittered the remaining years of his life and hurried him to an untimely grave his old enemies at india house were still powerful and active and they had been reinforced by a large band of allies whose violence far exceeded their own the whole crew of pilferers and oppressors from whom he had rescued bengal persecuted him with the implacable rancour which belongs to such abject natures many of them even invested their property in india stock merely that they might be better able to annoy the man whose firmness had set bounds to their rapacity lying newspapers were set up for no purpose but to abuse him and the temper of the public mind was then such that these arts which under ordinary circumstances would have been ineffectual against truth and merit produced an extraordinary impression the great events which had taken place in india had called into existence a new class of englishmen to whom their countrymen gave the name of nabobs these persons had generally sprung from families neither ancient nor opulent they had generally been sent at an early age to the east and they had there acquired large fortunes which they had brought back to their native land 
It was natural that not having had much opportunity of mixing with the best society, they should exhibit some of the awkwardness and some of the pomposity of upstarts. It was natural that during their sojourn in Asia they should have acquired some tastes and habits surprising, if not disgusting, to persons who had never quitted Europe. It was natural that, having enjoyed great consideration in the East, they should not be disposed to sink into obscurity at home, and as they had money and had not birth or high connection, it was natural that they should display a little obtrusively the single advantage which they possessed. Wherever they settled, there was a kind of feud between them and the old nobility and gentry, similar to that which raged in France between the farmer-general and the marquis. This enmity to the aristocracy long continued to distinguish the servants of the company. More than twenty years after the time of which we are now speaking, Burke pronounced that among the Jacobins might be reckoned the East Indians almost to a man who cannot bear to find that their present importance does not bear a proportion to their wealth. The Nabob soon became a most unpopular class of men. Some of them had in the East displayed eminent talents and rendered great services to the state, but at home their talents were not shown to advantage, and their services were little known that they had sprung from obscurity, that they had acquired great wealth, that they exhibited it insolently, and that they spent it extravagantly, that they raised the price of everything in their neighbourhoods from fresh eggs to rotten boroughs, that their liveries outshone those of dukes, that their coaches were finer than that of the Lord Mayor, that the examples of their large and ill-governed households corrupted half the servants in the country, that some of them, with all their magnificence, could not catch the tone of good society, but in spite of the stud and the crowd of menials, of the plate and the Dresden china, of the venison and the burgundy, were still low men. These were things which excited, both in the class from which they had sprung, and in the class into which they attempted to force themselves, the bitter aversion which is the effect of mingled envy and contempt. But when it was also rumoured that the fortune which had enabled its possessor to eclipse the Lord Lieutenant on the race-ground, or to carry the county against the head of a house as old as a doomsday book, had been accumulated by violating public faith, by deposing legitimate princes, by reducing whole provinces to beggary, all the higher and better as well as all the low and evil parts of human nature were stirred against the wretch who had obtained by guilt and dishonour the riches which he now lavished with arrogant and inelegant profusion. The unfortunate nabob seemed to be made up of those foibles against which comedy has pointed the most merciless ridicule, and of those crimes which have thrown the deepest gloom over tragedy of Tucaré and Nero, of M. Jourdain and Richard the Third, a tempest of execration and derision, such as can be compared only to that outbreak of public feeling against the Puritans which took place at the time of the Restoration, burst on the servants of the company. The humane man was horror-struck at the way in which they had got their money, the thrifty man at the way in which they spent it. The dilettante sneered at their want of taste. The macaroni blackballed them as vulgar fellows. Writers the most unlike in sentiment and style, Methodists and libertines, philosophers and buffoons, were for once on the same side. It is hardly too much to say that during a space of about thirty years the whole lighter literature of England was coloured by the feelings which we have described. Foote brought on the stage an Anglo-Indian chief, dissolute, ungenerous, and tyrannical, ashamed of the humble friends of his youth, hating the aristocracy, yet childishly eager to be numbered among them, squandering his wealth on panders and flatterers, tricking out his chairman with the most costly hothouse flowers, and astounding the ignorant with a jargon about rupees, lakhs, and jagirs. Mackenzie, with more delicate humour, depicted a plain country family raised by the Indian acquisitions of one of its members to sudden opulence, an exciting derision by an awkward mimicry of the manners of the great. 
Cowper, in that lofty expostulation which glows with the very spirit of the Hebrew poets, placed the oppression of India foremost in the list of those national crimes for which God had punished England with years of disastrous war, with discomfiture in her own seas, and with the loss of her transatlantic empire. If any of our readers will take the trouble to search in the dusty recesses of circulating libraries for some novel published sixty years ago, the chance is that the villain or sub-villain of the story will prove to be a savage old nabob with an immense fortune, a tawny complexion, a bad liver, and a worse heart. Such, as far as we can now judge, was the feeling of the country respecting nabobs in general and clive was eminently the nabob the ablest the most celebrated the highest in rank the highest in fortune of all the fraternity his wealth was exhibited in a manner which could not fail to excite odium he lived with great magnificence in berkeley square he reared one palace in shropshire and another at claremont his parliamentary influence might vie with that of the greatest families but in all this splendour and power envy found something to sneer at. On some of his relations wealth and dignity seemed to have sat as awkwardly as on Mackenzie's Marjorie Mushroom. Nor was he himself, with all his great qualities, free from those weaknesses which the satirists of that age represented as characteristic of his whole class. In the field, indeed, his habits were remarkably simple. He was constantly on horseback, was never seen but in his uniform, never wore silk, never entered a palanquin, and was content with the plainest fare. But when he was no longer at the head of an army, he laid aside this Spartan temperance for the ostentatious luxury of a Sybarite. Though his person was ungraceful, and though his harsh features were redeemed from vulgar ugliness only by their stern, dauntless, and commanding expression, he was fond of rich and gay clothing, and replenished his wardrobe with absurd profusion. Sir John Malcolm gives us a letter worthy of Sir Matthew Might, in which Clive orders two hundred shirts, the best and finest that could be got for love or money. A few follies of this description, grossly exaggerated by report, produced an unfavourable impression on the public mind. But this was not the worst. Black stories, of which the greater part were pure inventions, were circulated touching his conduct in the East. He had to bear the whole odium, not only of those bad acts, to which he had once or twice stooped, but of all the bad acts of all the English in India, of bad acts committed when he was absent, nay, of bad acts which he had manfully opposed and severely punished. The very abuses against which he had waged an honest, resolute, and successful war were laid to his account. He was, in fact, regarded as the personification of all the vices and weaknesses which the public, with or without reason, ascribed to the English adventurers in Asia. We have ourselves heard old men, who knew nothing of his history, but who still retained the prejudices conceived in their youth, talk of him as an incarnate fiend. Johnson always held this language. Brown, whom Clive employed to lay out his pleasure grounds, was amazed to see in the house of his noble employer a chest which had once been filled with gold from the treasury of Morshedabad, and could not understand how the conscience of the criminal could suffer him to sleep with such an object so near to his bedchamber. The peasantry of Surrey looked with mysterious horror on the stately house which was rising at Claremont, and whispered that the great wicked lord had ordered the walls to be made so thick in order to keep out the devil who would one day carry him away bodily. Among the gaping clowns who drank in this frightful story was a worthless, ugly lad of the name of Hunt, since widely known as William Huntington S.S., and the superstition which was strangely mingled with the knavery of that remarkable impostor seems to have derived no small nutriment from the tales which he heard of the life and character of Clive. In the meantime, the impulse which Clive had given to the administration of Bengal was constantly becoming fainter and fainter. His policy was to a great extent abandoned, the abuses which he had suppressed began to revive, 
and at length the evils which a bad government had engendered were aggravated by one of those fearful visitations which the best government cannot avert. In the summer of 1770 the rains failed. The earth was parched up, the tanks were empty, the rivers shrunk within their beds, and a famine such as is known only in countries where every household depends for support on its own little patch of cultivation filled the whole valley of the Ganges with misery and death. Tender and delicate women, whose veils had never been lifted before the public gaze, came forth from the inner chambers in which eastern jealousy had kept watch over their beauty, threw themselves on the earth before the passers-by, and with loud wailings implored a handful of rice for their children. The Hoogli every day rolled down thousands of corpses close to the porticoes and gardens of the English conquerors. The very streets of Calcutta were blocked up by the dying and the dead. The lean and feeble survivors had not energy enough to bear the bodies of their kindred to the funeral pile or to the holy river, or even to scare away the jackals and vultures who fed on human remains in the face of day. The extent of the mortality was never ascertained, but it was popularly reckoned by millions. This melancholy intelligence added to the excitement which already prevailed in England on Indian subjects. The proprietors of East India stock were uneasy about their dividends. All men of common humanity were touched by the calamities of our unhappy subjects, and indignation soon began to mingle itself with pity. It was rumoured that the company's servants had created the famine by engrossing all the rice of the country, that they had sold grain for eight, ten, twelve times the price at which they had bought it, that one English functionary, who, the year before, was not worth a hundred guineas, had, during that season of misery, remitted sixty thousand pounds to London. These charges we believe to have been unfounded. That servants of the company had ventured, ever since Clive's departure, to deal in rice is probable. That if they dealt in rice they must have gained by the scarcity is certain. But there is no reason for thinking that they either produced or aggravated an evil which physical causes sufficiently explain. The outcry which was raised against them on this occasion was, we suspect, as absurd as the imputations which, in times of dearth at home, were once thrown by statesmen and judges, and are still thrown by two or three old women, on the corn factors. It was, however, so loud and so general that it appears to have imposed even on an intellect raised so high above vulgar prejudices as that of Adam Smith. What was still more extraordinary, these unhappy events greatly increased the unpopularity of Lord Clive. He had been some years in England when the famine took place. None of his acts had the smallest tendency to produce such a calamity. If the servants of the company had traded in rice, they had done so in direct contravention of the rule which he had laid down, and while in power had resolutely enforced. But, in the eyes of his countrymen, he was, as we have said, the Nabob, the Anglo-Indian character personified, and while he was building and planting in Surrey, he was held responsible for all the effects of a dry season in Bengal. Parliament had hitherto bestowed very little attention on our eastern possessions. Since the death of George the Second, a rapid succession of weak administrations, each of which was in turn flattered and betrayed by the court, had held the semblance of power. Intrigues in the palace, riots in the capital, and insurrectionary movements in the American colonies had left the advisers of the crown little leisure to study Indian politics. When they did interfere, their interference was feeble and irresolute. Lord Chatham, indeed, during the short period of his ascendancy in the council of George the Third, had meditated a bold attack on the company, but his plans were rendered abortive by the strange malady which about that time began to overcloud his splendid genius. At length, in 1772, it was generally felt that Parliament could no longer neglect the affairs of India. The government was stronger than any which had held power since the breach between Mr. Pitt and the great Whig connection in 1761. 
no pressing question of domestic or european policy required the attention of public men there was a short and elusive lull between two tempests the excitement produced by the middlesex election was over the discontents of america did not yet threaten civil war the financial difficulties of the company brought on a crisis the ministers were forced to take up the subject and the whole storm which had long been gathering now broke at once on the head of clive his situation was indeed singularly unfortunate he was hated throughout the country hated at the india house hated above all by those wealthy and powerful servants of the company whose rapacity and tyranny he had withstood he had to bear the double odium of his bad and his good actions of every indian abuse and of every indian reform the state of the political world was such that he could count on the support of no powerful connection the party to which he had belonged that of george grenville had been hostile to the government and yet had never cordially united with the other sections of the opposition with the little band which still followed the fortunes of lord chatham or with the large and respectable body of which lord rockingham was the acknowledged leader george grenville was now dead his followers were scattered and clive unconnected with any of the powerful factions which divided the parliament could reckon only on the votes of those members who were returned by himself his enemies particularly those who were the enemies of his virtues were unscrupulous ferocious implacable their malevolence aimed at nothing less than the utter ruin of his fame and fortune they wished to see him expelled from parliament to see his spurs chopped off to see his estate confiscated and it may be doubted whether even such a result as this would have quenched their thirst for revenge clive's parliamentary tactics resembled his military tactics deserted surrounded outnumbered and with everything at stake he did not even deign to stand on the defensive but pushed boldly forward to the attack at an early stage of the discussion on indian affairs he rose and in a long and elaborate speech vindicated himself from a large part of the accusations which had been brought against him he is said to have produced a great impression on his audience lord chatham who now the ghost of his former self loved to haunt the scene of his glory was that night under the gallery of the house of commons and declared that he had never heard a finer speech it was subsequently printed under clive's direction and when the fullest allowance has been made for the assistance which he may have obtained from literary friends proves him to have possessed not merely strong sense and a manly spirit but talents both for disquisition and declamation which assiduous culture might have improved into the highest excellence he confined his defence on this occasion to the measures of his last administration and succeeded so far that his enemies thenceforth thought it expedient to direct their attacks chiefly against the earlier part of his life the earlier part of his life unfortunately presented some assailable points to their hostility a committee was chosen by ballot to inquire into the affairs of india and by this committee the whole history of that great revolution which threw down Suraja Daula and raised Mir Jafir was sifted with malignant care. Clive was subjected to the most unsparing examination and cross-examination, and afterwards bitterly complained that he, the Baron of Plassey, had been treated like a sheep-stealer. The boldness and ingenuousness of his replies would alone suffice to show how alien from his nature were the frauds to which in the course of his eastern negotiations he had sometimes descended he avowed the arts which he had employed to deceive omichund and resolutely said that he was not ashamed of them and that in the same circumstances he would act again in the same manner he admitted that he had received immense sums from mir jaffier but he denied that in doing so he had violated any obligation of morality or honour he laid claim on the contrary and not without some reason to the praise of eminent disinterestedness he described in vivid language the situation in which his victory had placed him great princes dependent on his pleasure an opulent city afraid of being given up to plunder wealthy bankers bidding against each other for his smiles vaults piled with gold and jewels thrown open to him alone 
"'By God, Mr. Chairman,' he exclaimed, "'at this moment I stand astonished at my own moderation.' The inquiry was so extensive that the houses rose before it had been completed. It was continued in the following session. When at length the committee had concluded its labours, enlightened and impartial men had little difficulty in making up their minds as to the result. It was clear that Clive had been guilty of some acts which it is impossible to vindicate without attacking the authority of all the most sacred laws which regulate the intercourse of individuals and of states. But it was equally clear that he had displayed great talents and even great virtues, that he had rendered eminent services both to his country and to the people of India, and that it was in truth not for his dealings with Mir Jafir, nor for the fraud which he had practised on Omichund, but for his determined resistance to avarice and tyranny, that he was now called in question. End of chapter 6Clive by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ordinary criminal justice knows nothing of set off. The greatest desert cannot be pleaded in answer to a charge of the slightest transgression. If a man has sold beer on a Sunday morning, it is no defence that he has saved the life of a fellow creature at the risk of his own. If he has harnessed a Newfoundland dog to his little child's carriage, it is no defence that he was wounded at Waterloo. But it is not in this way that we ought to deal with men who, raised far above ordinary restraints, and tried by far more than ordinary temptations, are entitled to a more than ordinary measure of indulgence. Such men should be judged by their contemporaries as they will be judged by posterity. Their bad actions ought not indeed to be called good, but their good and bad actions ought to be fairly weighed, and if on the whole the good preponderate, the sentence ought to be one not merely of acquittal, but of approbation. Not a single great ruler in history can be absolved by a judge who fixes his eye inexorably on one or two unjustifiable acts. Bruce, the deliverer of Scotland, Morris, the deliverer of Germany, William, the deliverer of Holland, his great descendant, the deliverer of England, Murray, the good regent, Cosmo, the father of his country, Henry the Fourth of France, Peter the Great of Russia, how would the best of them pass such a scrutiny? History takes wider views, and the best tribunal for great political cases is the tribunal which anticipates the verdict of history. Reasonable and moderate men of all parties felt this in Clive's case. They could not pronounce him blameless, but they were not disposed to abandon him to that low-minded and rancorous pack who had run him down and were eager to worry him to death. Lord North, though not very friendly to him, was not disposed to go to extremities against him. While the inquiry was still in progress, Clive, who had some years before been created a Knight of the Bath, was installed with great pomp in Henry the Seventh's chapel. He was soon after appointed Lord Lieutenant of Shropshire. When he kissed hands, George the Third, who had always been partial to him, admitted him to a private audience, talked to him for half an hour on Indian politics, and was visibly affected when the persecuted general spoke of his services and of the way in which they had been requited. At length the charges came in a definite form before the House of Commons. Burgoyne, chairman of the committee, a man of wit, fashion, and honour, an agreeable dramatic writer, an officer whose courage was never questioned, and whose skill was at that time highly esteemed, appeared as the accuser. The members of the administration took different sides, for in that age all questions were open questions, except such as were brought forward by the government, or such as implied censure on the government. Thurlow, the attorney-general, was among the assailants. Wedderburn, the solicitor-general, strongly attached to Clive, defended his friend with extraordinary force of argument and language. It is a curious circumstance that some years later Thurlow was the most conspicuous champion of Warren Hastings, while Wedderburn was among the most unrelenting persecutors of that great, though not faultless, statesman. 
Clive spoke in his own defence at less length and with less art than in the preceding year, but with much energy and pathos. He recounted his great actions and his wrongs, and after bidding his hearers remember that they were about to decide not only on his honour, but on their own, he retired from the house. The Commons resolved that acquisitions made by the arms of state belong to the state alone, and that it is illegal in the servants of the state to appropriate such acquisitions to themselves. They resolved that this wholesome rule appeared to have been systematically violated by the English functionaries in Bengal. On a subsequent day they went a step further, and resolved that Clive had, by means of the power which he possessed as commander of the British forces in India, obtained large sums from Mir Jaffier. Here the Commons stopped. They had voted the major and minor of Burgoyne's syllogism, but they shrank from drawing the logical conclusion. When it was moved that Lord Clive had abused his powers and set an evil example to the servants of the public, the previous question was put and carried. At length, long after the sun had risen on an animated debate, Wedderburn moved that Lord Clive had at the same time rendered great and meritorious services to his country, and this motion passed without a division. The result of this memorable inquiry appears to us on the whole honourable to the justice, moderation, and discernment of the commons. They had indeed no great temptation to do wrong. They would have been very bad judges of an accusation brought against Jenkinson or against Wilkes. But the question respecting Clive was not a party question, and the House accordingly acted with the good sense and good feeling which may always be expected from an assembly of English gentlemen not blinded by faction. The equitable and temperate proceedings of the British Parliament were set off to the greatest advantage by a foil. The wretched government of Louis the Fifteenth had murdered, directly or indirectly, almost every Frenchman who had served his country with distinction in the East. La Bourdonnais was flung into the Bastille, and after years of suffering left it only to die. Duplay, stripped of his immense fortune, and broken-heartedly by humiliating attendance in antechambers, sank into an obscure grave. Lally was dragged to the common place of execution with a gag between his lips. The commons of England, on the other hand, treated their living captain with that discriminating justice which is seldom shown except to the dead. They laid down sound general principles, they delicately pointed out where he had deviated from those principles, and they tempered the gentle censure with liberal eulogy. The contrast struck Voltaire, always partial to England, and always eager to expose the abuses of the parliaments of France. Indeed, he seems at this time to have meditated a history of the conquest of Bengal. He mentioned his design to Dr. Moore, when that amusing writer visited him at Fernay. Wedderburn took great interest in the matter, and pressed Clive to furnish materials. Had the plan been carried into execution, we have no doubt that Voltaire would have produced a book containing much lively and picturesque narrative, many just and humane sentiments poignantly expressed, many grotesque blunders, many sneers at the mosaic chronology, much scandal about the Catholic missionaries, and much sublime theophilanthropy stolen from the New Testament and put into the mouths of virtuous and philosophical Brahmins. Clive was now secure in the enjoyment of his fortune and his honours. He was surrounded by attached friends and relations, and he had not yet passed the season of vigorous bodily and mental exertion. But clouds had long been gathering over his mind, and now settled on it in thick darkness. From early youth he had been subject to fits of that strange melancholy which rejoiceth exceedingly and is glad when it can find the grave. While still a writer at Madras, he had twice attempted to destroy himself. Business and prosperity had produced a salutary effect on his spirits. In India, while he was occupied by great affairs, in England, while wealth and rank had still the charm of novelty, he had borne up against his constitutional misery. But he had now nothing to do and nothing to wish for. His active spirit in an inactive situation drooped and withered like a plant in an uncongenial air. 
the malignity with which his enemies had pursued him the indignity with which he had been treated by the committee the censure lenient as it was which the house of commons had pronounced the knowledge that he was regarded by a large portion of his countrymen as a cruel and perfidious tyrant all concurred to irritate and depress him in the meantime his temper was tried by acute physical suffering during his long residence in tropical climates he had contracted several painful distempers in order to obtain ease he called in the help of opium and he was gradually enslaved by this treacherous ally to the last however his genius occasionally flashed through the gloom it was said that he would sometimes after sitting silent and torpid for hours rouse himself to the discussion of some great question would display in full vigour all the talents of the soldier and the statesman and would then sink back into his melancholy repose the disputes with america had now become so serious that an appeal to the sword seemed inevitable and the ministers were desirous to avail themselves of the services of clive had he still been what he was when he raised the siege of patna and annihilated the dutch army and navy at the mouth of the ganges it is not improbable that the resistance of the colonists would have been put down and that the inevitable separation would have been deferred for a few years but it was too late his strong mind was fast sinking under many kinds of suffering on the twenty second of november seventeen seventy four he died by his own hand he had just completed his forty-ninth year in the awful close of so much prosperity and glory the vulgar saw only a confirmation of all their prejudices and some men of real piety and genius so far forgot the maxims both of religion and of philosophy as confidently to ascribe the mournful event to the just vengeance of god and to the horrors of an evil conscience it is with very different feelings that we contemplate the spectacle of a great mind ruined by the weariness of satiety by the pangs of wounded honour by fatal diseases and more fatal remedies clive committed great faults and we have not attempted to disguise them but his faults when weighed against his merits and viewed in connection with his temptations do not appear to us to deprive him of his right to an honourable place in the estimation of posterity from his first visit to india dates the renown of the english arms in the east till he appeared his countrymen were despised as mere peddlers while the french were revered as a people formed for victory and command his courage and capacity dissolved the charm with the defence of arcot commences that long series of oriental triumphs which closes with the fall of ghizni nor must we forget that he was only twenty-five years old when he approved himself ripe for military command this is a rare if not a singular distinction it is true that alexander conde charles the twelfth won great battles at a still earlier age but those princes were surrounded by veteran generals of distinguished skill to whose suggestions must be attributed the victories of the granicus of rocroi and of narva clyde an inexperienced youth had yet more experience than any of those who served under him he had to form himself to form his officers and to form his army the only man as far as we recollect who at an equally early age ever gave equal proof of talents for war was napoleon bonaparte from clive's second visit to india dates the political ascendancy of the english in that country his dexterity and resolution realized in the course of a few months more than the gorgeous visions which had floated before the imagination of Duplay, Such an extent of cultivated territory, such an amount of revenue, such a multitude of subjects, was never added to the dominion of Rome by the most successful proconsul. Nor were such wealthy spoils ever borne under arches of triumph, down the sacred way and through the crowded forum to the threshold of Tarpeian Jove the fame of those who subdued antiochus and tigranes grows dim when compared with the splendour of the exploits which the young english adventurer achieved at the head of an army not equal in numbers to one half of a roman legion 
From Clive's third visit to India dates the purity of the administration of our Eastern Empire. When he landed in Calcutta in 1765, Bengal was regarded as a place to which Englishmen were sent only to get rich by any means in the shortest possible time. He first made dauntless and unsparing war on that gigantic system of oppression, extortion, and corruption. In that war he manfully put to hazard his ease, his fame, and his splendid fortune. The same sense of justice which forbids us to conceal or extenuate the faults of his earlier days compels us to admit that those faults were nobly repaired. If the reproach of the company and of its servants has been taken away, if in India the yoke of foreign masters, elsewhere the heaviest of all yokes, has been found lighter than that of any native dynasty, if to that gang of public robbers which formerly spread terror through the whole plain of Bengal has succeeded a body of functionaries not more highly distinguished by ability and diligence than by integrity, disinterestedness, and public spirit, if we now see such men as Monroe, Elphinstone and Metcalfe, after leading victorious armies, after making and deposing kings, return, proud of their honourable poverty, from a land which once held out to every greedy factor the hope of boundless wealth, the praise is in no small measure due to Clive. His name stands high on the roll of conquerors, but it is found in a better list, in the list of those who have done and suffered much for the happiness of mankind. To the warrior, history will assign a place in the same rank with Lucullus and Trajan. Nor will she deny to the reformer a share of that veneration with which France cherishes the memory of Turgot, and with which the latest generations of Hindus will contemplate the statue of Lord William Bentinck. End of chapter 7 Recording by Nicholas Clifford, Middlebury, Vermont, USA. End of Lord Clive by Thomas Babington Macaulay.